Hello, good evening. T uh, tonight I bring to you a discussion on the dual nature of Russian civilization. Uh, I'm very lucky to be joined by Apostolic Majesty. How are you this evening, sir? Hello, Hitman. Thank you so much for inviting me on, and it's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion. I think there is a lot to uh, discuss and debate, and, uh, well, the whole sort of scope of Russian history. So, uh, absolutely looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so, just to um, get started off with, uh, so on this presentation I have up, um, you can see I've got uh, two different versions of the Russian coat of arms. The one on the left is um, the current arm, coat of arms of the Russian Federation, uh, which was uh, created in 1993, and the one on the right is a much older one from uh, the 19th century, specifically the reign of um, Alexander III. The um, reason I brought them up is um, it's, it's just interesting to see this um, this tradition that's been kept of even though it's not quite the same, uh, there are many elements that have been copied across onto this newer cult of arms from, from the older one. <clears throat> and um, obviously, just going back further, the symbol the symbol of the double-headed eagle is not unique to Russia. It is much, much older. Uh, it goes back, obviously, to the Byz Byzantines. Um, also, you see it with the, um, the Austrian Empire and even Prussia and the German Empire, too. It's a, a, a long-held and heraldic symbol. And then um, I think it's perfect uh, for this discussion with Russia having these two natures, each represented by each head of the eagle, and what your thoughts on all of that? Well, I mean, I personally actually don't like the, the modern Russian flag. I think it's an inverted and pale imitation of the Romanov dynasty. And I think it's interesting that this was actually created before Putin. This was created during the presidency of Yeltsin. Um, before you can say the Russian Republic, which was very much under the influence of the West, became the Russian state, so to speak, even though the official name was the Russian Federation. So in this sense, all of these symbols, affectations, the only real noteworthy thing in terms of the sort of transformation of the heraldry, the, the national symbolism here, is the fact that the gold background of the Romanov flag which isn't here but of course contrasts with the black eagle has been inverted and now the gold has become the eagle there's actually quite a i think a wonderful flag when looking at the uh conflicted nation and uh, nature of russian civilization which is the banner of the armed forces of russia it is a red flag in the soviet style with gold rims like the original soviet flag with slavonic the star of course definitely not a romanov symbol and then you have the federation coat of arms you see here emblazoned in the front of it so you see an attempt to reconcile the soviet history and this diluted iteration of playing on the legacy of the romanovs all fused into one flag um of course the one sort of constant carryover which isn't flipped is of course the symbolism always of saint george slaying the lion and of course this predates even the adoption of the double eagle and the romanov heraldry and the crown you can see here of catherine the great um so just to clarify it's a dragon isn't it not a lion uh n no uh, uh george slaying the dragon um unless i'm unless i'm terribly wrong um no sorry you said lion not dragon saint george did i oh sorry <laughs> no, thank you. yes absolutely lizard dragon absolutely sorry i often i often sort of spew out nonsense just correct me whenever i do that but uh yes saint george slaying the dragon thank you and it's fine just making sure um well no i agree with you i much prefer the one on the left it's so much more majestic and splendid whereas the one on the left is a, a, a bit bare, bare bones but um no, absolutely. So, so just to clarify what I mean by dual nature. So, throughout Russian history, I feel it has two natures. Uh, one nature is its own nature. Um, I think a good summary of this is the title of the series you do in your channel AM, which I've taken part in on a couple of streams: and um, Orthodoxy, Autocracy, and Nationality. This, to me, seems to be the natural uh, ideology of Russia. Whereas on the other hand, um, 
it's usually accepted from the reign of peace the great onwards that a great westernization nature has come in as well one that looks to europe for inspiration um and is often quite looking for reform and progress in order to benefit uh, russia but i also understand from a little bit of a conversation we were having before we went live that um you feel this or westernization trend even goes back further well it's interesting that you bring up uvarov's uh trifactor of orthodoxy autocracy and nationality because uvarov of course was thinking of this state ideology for the russian empire in a context of revolutionary turmoil throughout europe russia's own invasion at the hands of napoleon in 1812 and the very conflicted legacy of pulling russia towards the west and back again during the reign of tsar alexander the first however i see orthodoxy autocracy and nationality very much as a post-modern conception which indeed all politics post the french revolution from the right is in some respect and so i think going back to this time before the revolution before peter the great um, I would actually look to someone like Ivan the Terrible and see many parallels between Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great, even down to the attempt to establish maritime trading relationships with the West, such as the, uh, the Moscovy Company, and the attempt to establish a new capital on the Baltic Sea, Ivanograd in the case of Ivan the Great, and St. Petersburg in the case, obviously, of Peter the Great. The great social upheavals entailed by the Oplichnina and of course the attempts to essentially bring Russia kicking and screaming into the 18th century as with Peter the Great. So I find it interesting to sort of look at a point where you say Russia was had a true nature and that nature was essentially imposed on it because you see here the nature of the double-headed eagle uh, to that extent, you can say even that was very much imposed on Russia at some later point in its history. So, for example, just looking at the ideology of the double-headed eagle, you mentioned earlier that this symbol isn't unique to Russia. Indeed, it's not unique to Russia. It is the symbol of the Eastern Roman Empire. It represents Rome on the one hand and Constantinople on the other, representing the two imperial capitals the two eagles pointed west and pointed east and as a result of this this symbol was then adopted by virtually every empire claiming some legacy to rome i believe from serbia albania all the way to the holy roman empire and of course russia with the end of the byzantine empire or eastern roman empire in the 15th century there is very much a conscious attempt by the court of ivan the third and his byzantine second wife to imbibe this growing muscovite state which had arisen from the ashes of the mongol invasion in the 13th century and give it this glorious legacy attached to that of eastern rome and the symbol of the protection of orthodox christendom before the fall of Constantinople, you can say that Russia was simply an orthodox state, but after the fall of Constantinople, it becomes the great orthodox state. All the rest having either been thoroughly humbled or placed under direct subjugation from either Catholic populations or indeed Muslim populations. So you can say that there is an aspect of all of Russian history representing this turmoil, what is indeed a genuine Russian civilization, what is a Russia spirit, because I would say that you bring this even further back. You look at, say, for example, at Kiev and Rus civilization, something which I didn't think was controversial, but actually seems rather controversial in terms of putting this idea out there, is the idea that there can be any continuity between the Rus civilization from the Rurikids and the Muscovite state that comes afterwards. When do you draw the line of this irrevocable breach in Russian civilization? And that's why I find Russian history so fascinating and uh, constantly sort of, I'm reinvigorated by the process of whenever I encounter a particular period because from Lenin and the contrast in the Russian Civil War and the white movement to the collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s to looking back at the Christianization of Russia under uh, Vladimir the Great. Um, I, I can't 
us pick one event in history and say, this is where Westernization began and Russia had already had some preconceived and definite identity before then. You know, you can say that what is Russian sort of definite, what is Russia's definite identity? Is it pagan even? Even if we move back before Vladimir the Great, um, does it sort of destiny lie in Kiev, which I think is a very pertinent point to consider as we're having this conversation, or does it lie in Moscow? Um, I know that's banding about lots of several concepts here, but I just want to try and give the impression that this concept of the nature of Russian civilization and Russian dualism is fluid and it is constant. Well, thank you very much for that, um, AM. Uh, yes, yeah, so even <clears throat> though we may say that Russia may have no natural ideology, um, I think it is fair to say that it still has these two ideas that have battered it out over the centuries. And um, obviously you mentioned there about um, Ivan the Terrible perhaps being some beginning point um, of westernization, because there's an interesting contrast with him and Peter the Great, because um, I remember watching your, it was your lecture or your discussion on Peter the Great actually, and you had this concept of of Sardom to empire, because indeed um, Ivan the Terrible um, was the first Tsar of Russia, and Peace the Great um, reformed it into the Russian Empire. And you, but of course, with um, Ivan the Terrible as well, before you have the Sardom, you simply have the Principality of Muscovy, and <clears throat> so, like from Sardom to Empire, you have Principality to Sardom. So that in itself is an um, a modernizing tra transition in, in some respects. But but modernizing to what um, exactly? Obviously, the title of prince or grand prince, because of the nature of pre-Muscovite civilization, was very much based on a assembly of city-states and princes rather than this autocratic empire which arises out of the Muscovite state. So when looking at even the titles of Tsar, well, obviously, Tsar is Caesar, in the same way that Kaiser has an imperial connotation in the West, um, unless you're going to get into very specific and rather autistic discussions about the nature of the senior emperor of Augustus and junior emperor of Caesar. Um, Caesar has a definite imperial connotation. It was something understood by the Russians, certainly by uh, Patriarch, or sorry, Metropolitan Mercurius, when he crowned Ivan the Third, uh, Ivan the Fourth, as Tsar of Russia. Uh, I believe it was in the year fifteen forty-seven. So when Peter the Great makes the conscious attempt to change the empire from Tsardom to empire. For the Russians, it doesn't represent an actual increase in rank. What it does represent is an attempt by Peter the Great to acknowledge that rank, have that rank acknowledged among other European powers. This is Russia entering onto the European stage as a great power, and Russia wants to be treated as such. It is He is conscious of a diplomatic framework Whereas for Russia, the idea that the Tsar has transitioned his name from an empire is just a nonsense. And you can say that far more significant than Peter the Great's transition from this intrinsically Russian title, which is hearkening back to the protection of Orthodox Christendom and Eastern Rome, and of obviously substituting this title just to basically achieve parity with the Holy Roman Empire, which he doesn't actually get get through. I think it's more interesting to look at, say, for example, the dissolution of the patriarchal seat, something that the Russian state desperately tried to achieve this rank of patriarch, i.e. comparable to the ecumenical head of the Orthodox Church in Constantinople. And what does Peter the Great do? He comes in he abolishes it and subordinates the church to that essentially of a state functionary beyond that of having a patriarch who is equal, perhaps even higher in some respects than the symbolic temporal head, which is encapsulated in the Tsar, now emperor. We now have this idea of the state and the church being fused together and the affairs of the church being led by a procurator of the Holy Synod. And you can say that that more than the change in the title, this fusing of spiritual and temporal power in the form 
of the Tsar is really one of the most crucial steps in terms of understanding the autocracy that is reasserted by Uvarov in the 19th century. Well, thank you for the, those comments there. I, um, sort of essentially, um, you have a transition from a sort of alliance between the temporal and the spiritual, um, a la, say, the Holy Roman Emperor and the Pope um, back in the medieval times. Um, and but you have that swapped out for a form of um, Russian Caesar papism, essentially. Yes, I think um, it helps that the seat of essentially before even Peter the Great, the seat of the patriarch was in within the Russian Empire. It was within Moscow. Previously, the office of the Metropolitan had been in Kiev. Uh, then it was moved, I believe, to uh, Vladimir, which is east of um, east of Moscow. Then, of course moved into Moscow and elevated to that of a metropolitan, which is sort of like the Western equivalent of a national primate or an archbishop, kind of like the Archbishop of Canterbury. And then this was elevated to a patriarchal see, which for the Orthodox community is on par with the Pope, if not representing essentially a Russian Pope. So in this sense, it's more than Caesar or papism. You're not just demoting the Pope, you're abolishing the papacy in a word. I, I see. Well, thank you for that um, point of clarity. Uh, so now we've sort of had those initial comments have been made. I want to sort of move on with the presentation. So uh, for so for the nature of this, um, again, I very much want to start with the reign of peace of the great, where I feel there was a real earnest um, move towards Westernization. So um, so for sort of throughout the 18th century. Um, I've this westernization westernization nature is overwhelmingly dominant. So I have here three images of three different um, Russian rulers. You've got Peter the Great, uh, Elizabeth the Third, and then Catherine the Great. Um, all three of them very much were committed to westernization and the principles of the Enlightenment in the 18th century. I, um, how far do you would you agree with that? Um, Catherine the Great certainly. Um... Elizabeth I, who is the illegitimate daughter of Peter the Great, uh, not so much, um, but definitely Catherine the Great. Oh, thank you for that. No, because I just did... Yes, yeah, so I was certain of Peter and Catherine. Um, I did some looking around research on Elizabeth, because I wasn't sure whether to include her or not, and um, considering her patronage of a lot of of art and culture, I felt it necessary to, to include her. Well, I think just in terms of qualifying the Enlightenment, well, what do you mean essentially by the Enlightenment? I mean, do you mean Cartesianism or do you mean the works of Voltaire? I mean, in regards to Peter the Great, Peter the Great wasn't a very, ab a man who didn't really think in the abstracts. Um, Peter the Great was a very practical man. This is the man who made himself an apprentice to a master shipbuilder in a shipwright in the Netherlands and worked out how to make Dutch merchant ships. This is the man who practiced dentistry on various members of the court. Um, he was very much concerned with practical knowledge. And of course, in the attainment of absolute power, which he essentially achieved in the uh, baptism of fire that was the Great Northern War. Whereas Catherine the Great was the one who patronized various scholars who set up institutes of higher learning, who attempted to style herself as consciously an enlightened monarch, whatever that means, enlightened despot in the same manner, say for example, of Peter the Great or Joseph of Austria. And of course, corresponding with people directly like Voltaire, who gives her the epithet of the great. So I think it's important to understand that Catherine the Great and Peter the Great are very <laughs> different monarchs, despite them both uh, having the same epithet of the great. Well, thank you for the um, clarification um, on that, that point. Uh, I was I was more when I was looking at this more trying to draw a link that they were still largely westernizing in in their well, well yes well well like I guess westernizing in what form essentially I mean Peter the Great going over and wanting to build a navy on the Dutch model certainly is a is a manner of sort of trying to imbue Russia with some Western in, 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 innovation the idea of setting up a navy 
for an empire which Muscovy especially really had no naval tradition whatsoever. I mean, Muscovy, later Russia, was effectively landlocked. The only sort of port which was safe wasn't safe at all, which was at the Arctic Sea. And even though Russia, during the reign of Peter the Great, had finally reached the Pacific Ocean, Russia had no seafaring capabilities to really enter into the Pacific whatsoever. So in that sense, Peter the Great was a great westernizer, but not in the same manner, say, for example, of Catherine the Great, um, who was looking to the examples of rule set up most notably by Frederick the Great and attempting to style Russia on those. But of course, this is simply reflective of the fact that when we talk about westernization, obviously westernization will mean something if we're talking about the period from 1700 up until 1800. And of course, what is the one thing which really cools Catherine the Great's enthusiasm um, for westernization, whatever we really mean by that. It is, of course, the beheading of Louis XVI in 1793, three years before she dies. Um, so even during the reign of Catherine the Great, we have an attempt to cool this overabundant sort of almost Jacobin inspired revolutionary fervor, which has been directed from above. And we already see elements of this conservative uh, backlash against this in the reigns of her son, Paul I. And you can say this conflicted nature of the westernization process is encapsulated in the person of Alexander I, her grandson. No, I completely agree with you about um, Alexander being con conflicted. Um, and yes, no, yeah, with, with Catherine, I completely acknowledge that later on, she does have a change of heart based on the reality of the situation in France. So something I've neglected to mention up until now is to add a bit more nuance to Westernization. Uh, so on the one hand, as I said, there is this idea of enlightenment principles or reform on a Western European style to reform and make R Russia better. But in another sense, I believe there is a Westernization intent in terms of looking to Europe for power and influence. So in this period, um, I don't have a map, unfortunately, but Russia's borders do expand massively to the West, um, most notably through the partition to Poland un under Catherine. And of course, um, under Elizabeth, you have um, interventions in wars. So for example, you've got the War of Austrian Succession, and most significantly, you have the Seven Ye Years War. So. Russia's trying to play a part in greater European po politics. Uh, could I make an observation? Um, regarding Peter the Great's expansionism, obviously Peter the Great was interested in achieving a outlet into the sea, a window on the West. And his expansionism therefore is very noteworthy. He tries to expand into Azov, which doesn't hold very long, but he makes permanent and enduring gains at the expense of the Swedish Empire. Really, Peter the Great is responsible, as well as you can say, the dog-headed determination of Charles XII for the collapse of the Swedish Empire and the arrival of Russia as a Baltic power, which had never been before. And this is why I thought it pertinent to bring up Ivan the Great and look at the, the, the precedents for westernization, because Ivan the Great tried to do the same thing. The only difference, really, between Peter the Great and Ivan the Terrible in the situation is that Ivan failed to do this in the Livonian Wars, whereas Peter the Great succeeded, and he established a presence, a Russian presence on the Baltic through Livonia uh, and Estonia, which is you know modern-day northern Latvia and Estonia, uh, which would endure up until the collapse of the Soviet Union. No, 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 certainly he did make long and enduring gains, gains for, for Russia, um, and as did Catherine, though, as you've elucidated elsewhere, um, especially in that stream you did with um, Semyagog on Prometheanism, though Russia, or Catherine, did gain a lot of territory at the expense of Poland, um, arguably it probably wasn't a great long-term decision because it had previously been um, a buffer pu puppet state, uh, which had then been lost after it was carved up. And um, this will be especially um, pertinent later when we have the 
Napoleonic Wars um, with Napoleon just <clears throat> with Napoleon's invasion. Um, yes, I suppose if you want to sort of give an arch of how this affects the westernization efforts, I think Peter the Great's conquests for the sake of this stream are the most significant. But I would actually park the question of um, Poland, Lithuania for now, because it opens problems throughout the course of the 19th century for Russia. But you could almost say, well, my belief is that Russian civilization had already sort of received a permutation from Catholic Western Poland, because people really need to understand, especially during the 16th century, that Poland was a great power and Poland was Western focused in the sense that the King of Poland was almost in a position of direct vassalage to the Pope post the Tridentine reform, the Council of Trent. Whereas, of course, Poland becomes less significant in terms of its impact on the European Enlightenment through the course of the 18th century, and it becomes economically and less politically relevant. But as Peter the Great establishes his window on the West with St. Petersburg as the new capital of the Russian Empire, what does Catherine do? She affects her own great expansion towards the sea, except her expansion isn't directed into the Baltic Sea. Her expansion is directed into the Black Sea. She wants to form this new conception of Tarida, the, the Greek idea of the Crimea. She wants to reforge uh, Kerasones, uh, which had been a uh, Greek port at the um, at the mouth of the, uh, the mouth of the Dnieper River. She wanted to reforge cities such as Edessa. She created a um, a Greek colony, essentially, in a segment of Mariupol. Um, when we see the expansionism of Catherine the Great, regardless of looking at the partitions of Poland, we see a conscious attempt, uh, an intent of Catherine of emulating Peter the Great through the expansionism. Yet at the same time, there is this great hearkening back. There is this neoclassical element to Catherine the Great and also a Byzantine aspect to Catherine the Great. I mean, looking at Catherine the Great, just looking at her solely as being beholden to the tradition of the Enlightenment, I think is to do her a disservice. I mean, she was a great, complicated Machiavellian personality who was playing on several different traditions simultaneously. She was appealing to Peter the Great through her conquests, and yet she was also trying to restore to the nominal head of the orthodox world, Russia, the Third Rome, this idea of Russia's link with Byzantium, because Torida establishing the sort of neo-Greek Novorossiya, uh, which is now southern Ukraine and of course annexed parts of Russia, this was simply a stepping stone for the Greek plan and creating a new Byzantine Empire out of the European half of the Ottoman Empire. So again, if you're looking for the dual nature of Russian civilization, I think you can find many aspects of that, perhaps more cogently, perhaps more sort of uh, brilliantly expressed in Catherine the Great, rather, the, rather than the befuddlement of Alexander. <clears throat> yeah, no, thank you for, for bringing that up. <clears throat> Right. Yeah. Right. Hello. Right. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. No. Yeah. So, just wanted to move on a little bit. So, we obviously mentioned um, Alexander uh, being rather mixed. Yeah, which is so, but because to look at the um, great patriotic war, um, obviously with Napoleon's invasion and then his pushback and final defeat, uh, the sort of Russian reaction to that I think is a recurring theme. So, obviously, uh, we've mentioned the conquests made by um, previous monarchs, so Peter and Catherine. So, what I essentially see as a recurring theme in Russian history is the sort of the they're hit by an existential threat. So essentially, as we've mentioned, Poland, Lithuania, um, in the early 17th century, Moscow was actually occupied by by the Poles. So obviously this is a dire threat to Russia. Uh, so then over the course, they strengthen and push back 
eventually partitioning Poland. And then again, another threat rises from the West, which you have to push back in, push back in defeat. But, and, and this carries them on and on. And so I almost feel that, yes, they've seen a form of inspiration from the West, but also they've seen an, an antagonism which would uh, carry on. What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, well, regarding the, I mean, the Polish situation, um, when Catherine the Great was trying to justify the partitions of Poland, she was justifying it on the basis that so much of the Polish territory in the East had been part of the patrimony of the Kievan Rus Empire. So formerly members of the Orthodox Church who were essentially united into the Catholic Church as the uniates of the Eastern Catholics, although basically they were had been effectively Orthodox before then. These were Belarusian and essentially the group, which the name essentially is Ruthenian, which is the Western denominator of what is essentially Russian. But now Ruthenian can really mean Ukrainian and Belarusian. So in that sense, she believed that it was Russia's destiny to annex these territories, to revive that patrimony. My own theory on this is that the Russian sort of territorial patrony was split off forever with the Mongol conquest. And so what had been an empire which was clustered far more around the modern day boundaries of Ukraine, even up to the Carpathian Mountains, after the Mongol invasion, this territory was denied to the new Muscovite state and was instead occupied by Lithuania, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which then becomes Poland, Lithuania, and of course the Ottoman Empire. And over the course of all of these centuries, Russia is able to claw back aspects of this ancient patrimony and appeal, harken back to these old ideas, whilst also Catherine the Great attempts to justify the expansion of the empire whilst consolidating the internal nature of the empire and creating her new system of the governorates. So in terms of Russia sort of facing an existential threat and bouncing back, that's an obvious example. The fact that the Ottomans um, are essentially conducting the slave trade of uh, Orthodox Christians um, in the Pontic Steppe for hundreds of years, and then Russia comes back and becomes the dominant power in the Black Sea. How Poland and Lithuania, at a point, looked as if they were going to conquer Russia, or at least the King of Poland was also going to become the Tsar of Russia in a personal union possibility that Russia would have even become Catholic during the early 17th century. That is completely turned over. And by the end of the 18th century, formerly the great Catholic empire, Poland, is now occupied by the orthodox sovereign of the Russian empire. As for Napoleon, Napoleon is interesting in that Alexander I admired Napoleon. In fact, Alexander I quickly upon becoming Tsar after the assassination of his father Paul in 1801, actually helps the early Napoleon, who is not yet emperor, who is consul. It is as a result of the interventions of Napoleon and Alexander that a reform process begins in the Holy Roman Empire, which really accelerates its downfall and leads to its complete dissolution in the year 1806. However, after this process, after the you can say the um, betrayal of the promises Napoleon had made to the British and the Peace of Amiens, and indeed the commitment to the Peace of Europe. Alexander I then looks upon Napoleon, having originally said to essentially been more pro-Napoleon than his uh, father Paul, as a great menace to European stability, European civilization. And so he joyfully goes along with the Emperor Francis of Austria and only meets a, almost catacly a great cataclysm for the Russian army at the Battle of Austerlitz, where he himself is nearly captured. This enmity towards Napoleon continues until the Russian forces are decisively defeated at Friedland after an indecisive engagement of Elau in the War of the Fourth Coalition. And it's at Tilsit again, where Alexander I makes this great about turn, where he is able to charm the emperor into accepting what is for Napoleon a rather a rather sort of disadvantageous position um, for Napoleon, whilst Russia is able to keep all of its territories. Of course, Napoleon 
is not satisfied with the fact that the Russian Empire is expanding into Finland, wants to expand at the expense of the Ottoman Empire, and wants to continue trading with Britain as a potential counterweight to complete Napoleonic domination of the continent. And so, again, you can say when Napoleon does invade Russia in 1812, it reinforces this idea which is already present in Alexander the first that first that um, Napoleon was a great menace to European civilization indeed that he almost goes through a, a religious sort of reconversion as a result of the 1812 um, experience and of course seeing the fire and the devastation of Moscow as really some sort of a apocalyptic event in Russian history but in terms of the idiosyncrasies, of Alexander the First, who are the um, the greatest sort of theological influences on the person of Alexander the First? They're not coming from the Orthodox Church; they're coming from Protestant Lutheran circles. In the same way that he is coming back during the Congress of Vienna after the defeat of Napoleon, and wants Russia to acquire vast amounts of territory in all of the ancient patrimony of Poland, which would have essentially meant war with Austria and Prussia. So he is simultaneously exploring this, you can say, traditional expansionist aim of the Russian monarchs since Peter the Great. Yet at the same time, he promises to bestow this new Polish state under Russian suzerainty, effectively, with a new constitution <laughs> on the Western model, effectively, which could possibly have proved an example for the rest of Russia to follow. When you look at, say, for example, as of, um, of the Freemasons supporting the French Revolution, at that same time, Alexander I believes, or rather his advisor believes, that Freemasonry could be used as a tool for training the Russian civil service. So throughout all of his reign, Alexander I represents this fractured dichotomy of this aspect of Russian dualism. And he ends his life as a conflicted reformer. There are even sort of mystical tales that uh, he never actually died and he went off and became a Siberian hermit. I think if that were true, it would really sort of solidify this aspect of the the Western reformer czar who charmed Napoleon, who ended his life as a um as a Siberian monk, albeit that that is almost pure fantasy. I don't believe that was the case, which you can say necessitates some sort of reaction to this in the form of his brother Nicholas the First. No, absolutely. And um, just some other points I remember from your lectures on this. Um, another thing Alexander did, if I recall, is that um, did he not establish like a sort of a Spartan barrack system for training new soldiers? Um, and also, if I remember from the stream we did on um, Greek independence, um, he was tacitly supporting the Greek independence movement. Um, and also, if I it was John Capodistrius, who was his... Um, from foreign minister, essentially, they were looking to make him the, the new leader of Greece, weren't they? Uh, well, yes and no. I mean, regarding the military reform program, uh, again, this may not seem significant, but what is significant about it is that these, essentially these military communes, which Alexander I was trying to set up, were inspired by utopian socialists, or at least proto-socialists, uh, such as uh, Robert Owen in Wales. Um, they essentially try to hold, try to sort of reconceive the idea of being educated under military conditions, separating children from their families, things that seem very radical, very sort of Plato's Republic, which were being enacted by Alexander I. And of course, they turn into complete disaster zones and the inhabitants of these communes become mutinous and the whole project is disbanded when you get to the reign of Nicholas I, but not before you can say the mutinous elements in this conflicted Russia rise up during the Decembrist revolt. But again, if we look at the Greek example, Alexander I did not support the War of Greek Independence, even though there was the uh, Eteria, um, many of whose members were Russian Greeks um, operating out of Edessa and Crimea. A lot of the intellectual impetus came from Russian Greek Freemasons, and indeed, when we see the Epsilantis invasion into Romania, which is supposed to kick off this whole revolution in the Ottoman Empire, the European part of the European Empire, um, this doesn't receive Russian backing. Because Alexander I, while you can say he's a revolutionary in some part, he's adhering to this 
post-Napoleonic Metternichian world order, which essentially declares that the Ottoman Empire must be held up as a support of the European world order as representing some form of stability in the Balkans. So it's only tentatively later in the Greek War of Independence, when his brother Nicholas I becomes Tsar, does Russia tentatively support the War of Greek Independence. And at that time, almost out of necessity, because intervention has become a fact among the other powers in Europe, most notably Britain and France. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think I may have got um, Alexander and Nicholas's positions me mixed up there. Sorry, but yes, it was Nicholas who was um, tentatively supporting Greek independence and, and not Alexander. Um, so on that point, I actually want to move to the next slides. So coming to the 19th century and the reigns of um, Nicholas I, Alexander II and Alexander III, um, I feel in this period there's an attempt to try and maintain some sort of balancing act between these two natures of Russia. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, Nicholas I is often lambasted as an expansionary czar, but my contention was he was actually probably the most conservative in foreign policy out of all the czars, which considering the debacle of the Crimean War may seem counterintuitive, but that is very much my view. When he becomes czar, of course, he fights off and is able to contain the Decembrist revolt. He is confronted with the Belgian Revolution. He is confronted with the Polish Revolution. And really, you can say that this exposes the first, along with the Greek War of Independence, the first serious cracks in the world order that had been set up after the defeat of Napoleon. But he very much tries to steer sort of a limited form of Russian expansion in the Caucasus, something which had very much begun under the reigns of his predecessors dating back to Catherine the Great. And when we see the Crimean War, he is very much trying to maintain Russia's dominant influence over the Ottoman Empire against the interventions of the British and the French. So you could say that Nicholas I was trying to maintain the Ottoman Empire. Rather, it was simply a matter of who was maintaining it. In this case, he would prefer Russia to maintain it and potentially gain access to the Dardanelles and the Bosphorus Straits and counter British influence. But of course, Nicholas I's Minister Uvalov, Minister of uh, State Education and Popular Enlightenment, was responsible for the trifactor of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. But what that really meant, essentially, was fidelity to the Tsar, the Tsar as the bulwark, the embodiment of the nation, without which the nation would disintegrate. And in that sense, Russia was also indissoluble, it was whole. And orthodoxy was essentially the social pillar, the morality upon which the system of government was based on. So, really, you can say that this is looking to something more cogent, more coherent after the confusion that arises out of the uh, spirit of enlightenment optimism in the 18th century. Yet at the same time, Uvarov himself is conflicted as to what essentially this means, especially what nationality means. It is only really by the late reigns of Alexander II and Alexander III does nationality come to mean Slavic nationality in particular. And by extension, adhering to this idea of Slavic nationality entails possible expansionism as well, especially when we get to the reign of Nicholas II and we see pan-Slavism really become um, a core component in Russian foreign policy directed against the Ottoman Empire and directed against the Austrian Empire. And on the note of pan Slavism, it's also interesting because that um, concept, um, also, also along with um, in this period, you have a rise of um, how do I get this right? I think it's Slavophilism. Uh, so, with pan Slavism, like other pan national movements such as pan Germanism or pan um, Italianism, um, is essentially looking to unite um, all of the Slavs under one, one state. Um, and then on the other hand, uh, Slavophilism is an attempt to try and return Russia to a, an older form of ideology or government. So to my mind, uh, the, the Slavophilism is, seems to be more associated with the one aspect, while as pan Slavism is affiliated with, with the other. And what, what, what's your view? Well, I, I hesitate to make any definitive comment on the Slavophiles 
because the Slavophiles were sometimes more conservative in their inclinations. Sometimes the Slavophiles were actually Western innovators. They wanted parliamentary forms of government. And this is why looking at Slavic identity and national identity, even looking at the trifactor of orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality, and why I bring up the postmodern aspect of it, is that it rings rather hollow because nationality is essentially a sword directed at orthodoxy. On the one hand, you can say that if you have a homogenous population, they can all be full square behind the czar. Yet at the same time, a full embrace of the idea of nationality means that the nation comes before the czar. And in that case, the nation adopts a Rousseauian French revolutionary aspect in which it is no longer the czar who is sovereign, but the nation that is sovereign. And by extension, therefore, when you look, say, for example, at the uh, the budding sort of pan-Slavists in Ukraine, and later the sort of Ukrainian revivalist and nationalist movement in the late 19th century, then many of these adherents to pan-Slavism are looking at Cossack examples of free association and governance, and they are looking at essentially democratic antecedents to justify some form of decentralized reform autonomy for the various Slavic groups within the Russian Empire. So all of these ideas, it shouldn't just be simplified to one thing meaning one thing or one thing meaning another thing. You can say that in the right hands, pan-Slavism could act as some legitimating uh, cause for Russian expansionism at the expense of empires, most notably Austria, which have significant Slavic and indeed East Slavic populations. Yet at the same time, pan-Slavism could check the legitimacy of the Tsarist system. When looking at someone like Alexander II, for example, um, you can see the aspects of this Slavophilia, for lack of really a better word, especially with the Elms Ukas, which um, puts severe limitations on literature expression within the Ukrainian dialect um, at the same time. So that's within Pan-Slavism. But at the same time, there are serious curtailments of Polish and Lithuanian nationality that come out of the failed 1863 uprising. When we get to Alexander III, the Russian Empire begins infringing upon the ancient rights of the Baltic Germans, which has essentially been given those rights or reinforced those rights when Peter the Great took over the Livonian territories during the Great Northern War. So you can say that, again, Slavophilia, Pan-Slavism, but not at the expense of Russian domination within the empire. And it really is important to look at the empire of Russia from 1815 until 1914 as an empire. The Russians represent a plurality. That's it, a small majority. This is an empire of everything from Poles to Estonians to Finns to uh, Kalmyks and Chechnyans, etc. Um, and therefore, you can say that Russian nationality isn't enough to bind this state together. And therefore, we come to the idea of reinforcing the powers of the Tsar and this idea of Russia indivisible, which, looking from any of these points of view, is already quite shaky because Russia has moved well beyond the boundaries established by Ivan the Terrible and has moved into this essentially status as the world's largest continuous empire, which is still expanding. Under Alexander II, as a result of the humiliation of the Crimean War, Russia begins expanding into China with the, expand with the extension of Vladivostok, which literally means ruler of the East. Russia begins expanding into Central Asia, um, taking over the cities of Samarkand and Bukhara and pushing Russia's boundaries to essentially what is now the modern day boundary of uh, Tajikistan and Turkmenistan. Yet at the same time, he is beginning the process of internal consolidation and coming hard down, coming down hard on these various nationalities that are aspiring to some form of renegotiated settlement within the Russian Empire. Uh, yes, because um, another thought that has come to my mind is um, with this whole idea of the, um, the double-headed eagle that looks east and west. I often find through Russian history that if Russia ever has trouble in the West and is unable to increase its influence or power, it simply moves to the East in order to do so. And, you know, Alexander II is an example of that. And later on, um, I think this is a point you may have made at some point, but regarding um, the reign of Nicholas II, um, Russia fails to 
expand its influence in the east um, and due to the Russo-Japanese war. Uh, so what does it do? It tries to then push its influence west, which ultimately leads to its role in World War One. Well, I mean, that's there's a difference between sort of geographically looking west and east and intellectually looking west and east. I mean, take Uvarov, for example, Nicholas I's um, spin doctor. He was looking west. He was looking to the example of budding German nationalism <laughs> as a sort of uh, bedrock for his understanding of uh, post-French Napoleonic Russian ideology, which was simultaneously ancient and yet modern. When looking at Alexander II, we see an effort to consolidate the administration, reform the judiciary, bring in aspects of a local election system, very much looking to France, Napoleonic France at this point, the, set, the Second French Empire, as an example for which Russia should emulate. And of course, there are the much touted reform sort of Duma um, innovations towards the end of his life, albeit that's been considerably overblown. If there were to be a Duma, it would have very much been on the Prussian model that is of a government by the Tsar with consultation rather than a government by parliament like you see in Britain and eventually you'll see in France. So there is a physical looking West in terms of, say, for example, you brought up Nicholas II looking to Serbia and the protection of the Serbs as some sort of catalyst for some sort of a Russian revivalism in the Balkans whilst stemming from the disaster of the Russo-Japanese war. Yet at the same time, you say Alexander II, he's looking at the disaster of the Crimean war, which has temporarily checked Russian expansionism. He looks to the east, expands in Central Asia, expands at the expense of China in Vladivostok, in Outer Manchuria. And then when Russia is sufficiently organized again, redirects the attention west geographically and precipitates the 1877-1878 Russo-Turkish War, which ends in a Russian victory, albeit a Russian victory that was mitigated by a great power intervention, most notably led by Bon Benjamin Disraeli. <clears throat> oh, no, certainly, thank you for clarifying that. So, and then um, Moving on from that, um, as we're talking about Alexander II, I think it's also prudent to mention his um, um, abolishment of serfdom, uh, because then, because I think when Russia abolished serfdom in, I believe it was 1863, uh, it was actually the last um, European country to do so, because uh, I think before then the last um, countries to abolish it before Russia, I think, were Austria and some of the German states after um, 1848. Uh, so. So again, you sort of see Russia look into itself to reform after the catastrophe of the um, the Crimean War, and um, again I'm just thinking back to a another stream we did um, on the Crimean War. Um, there was very much, I think, the viewpoint of Alexander that he thought it was necessary to essentially abolish serfdom or potentially face some um, face revolution. Is that right? Well, that's the the famous quote which is attributed to Alexander II, which is, we must direct the revolution from above, or rather the emancipation from above, lest the serfs emancipate themselves from below. Um, but regarding this, it, it may be interesting to actually discuss the idea of serfdom and the implications that has for Russian dualism, because Alexander II's abolition of serfdom was really a response to, I don't really look at it as traditionalist. I look at it as very much following in the spirit of orthodoxy, autocracy, nationality. So at the same time, you can say that, uh, you know, this is a great czar emancipator, of course, 1863, uh, whatever person you're going to think of as a comparison, you're going to think of Abraham Lincoln in America. Well, of course, what Alexander II really achieves by the abolition of the serfdom, abolition of serfdom, is a very positive deal. Effectively, it gives a lot of nobles who had been in some way financially corrupt or financially compromised a way, essentially, of recouping some of their losses through the selling off of their serfs wholesale in what is essentially something which a debt system which will leave the serfs paying back their debts for decades. We still have the 
conventional village communities or mayors, one that Alexander III will attempt to reorganize with his system of local village captains. But also, what does the abolition of serfdom really do? It takes away a resource of the nobility, one that had been essentially given by willy-nilly by Catherine the Great, something that had been just to give a brief overview on why serfdom arose in Russia, serfdom came into Russia much later than other European powers. When you look at serfdom or even the idea of feudalism, it comes out of the Anglo-French context in the most notably like the 12th and the 13th century before the Black Death. However, when you look at Russia, Russia was so large, sprawling and sparsely populated that the idea of remaining in one plot of land was almost always a nonsense, especially when everything was sort of navigable by these great cities among these great uh, great waterways, the, uh, the Dnieper and the Volga. So when Russian feudalism does come into play, it arises because Tsar Ivan the Terrible wants to create a new aristocracy, which is loyal to him directly over the old class of boyars. And so forcing the peasants to remain in one place will prevent them, say, for example, following their favorite lords to wherever they're being exiled to during the Oprichnina. It is a way of saddling the peasants with these nouveau riche, these noblesse de robe of um, Ivan the Terrible. So it becomes as a way of cementing partial aristocratic fidelity to the Tsar. But by the time we get to the 19th century, that fidelity has now become counterintuitive for the government because Alexander II wants to introduce conscription, removing that middleman between the Tsar directly ordering about his masses, which in this case is the noble. And so with the abolition of the serfdom, we see the wholesale indiscriminate increase of conscription, and not just conscription for Russians, but conscription for people such as the Volga Germans, who had had essentially rights bestowed upon them by Catherine the Great to prevent such conscription taking place. So I look at something like the emancipation of serfdom and very much view it within the context of orthodoxy, orthodoxy and nationality, and not simply, as you can say, on the one hand, like Catherine the Great, he's appealing to Western ideas and this, you can say, oversimplified notion of emancipation, the rights of man, what have you. Yet at the same time, he is massively expanding the power of the state. <laughs> well, thank you for, for clar clarifying that. Um, I am uh, I'm actually going to need to step away for a moment, but I shouldn't be long. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> all right, well, you just... Um, have me so um i suppose instead of talking about this i'll wait for um hitman to come back and then i'll maybe he'll sort of ask me a question regarding uh, the manifesto of unshakable autocracy and uh Pobodonitsev, the the last great spin doctor of autocracy before we have the reforms of nicholas ii the reforms that were forced onto him in 1905, 1906, which gave Russia its first Duma, albeit Duma, Duma which never effectively worked with the monarchy. Um, I noticed that we have Vingel and Judge Caligula Bushman in the chat. Uh, hello, it's uh, lovely to see you here. Um, so yes, uh, if he probably has to do an emergency hit. Yeah. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if he comes back all uh, all flustered and drenched in blood. <laughs> um, if he has come back from an emergency hit. Um, but I suppose while we're waiting for him, uh, again, Judge Clicker Bishop, it's lovely to see you in the chat. Uh, I, I'm here, so you might as well ask me a question. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll find some way of prattling on. or not. <laughs> what does hmm, mean repostate? 
I hope he hasn't gone too long. Not sure what question to ask unprepared. Um, well, I guess the nature of the stream, I know Hitman wants to talk about things post Peter the Great, but I suppose any question on the grand arc of Russian civilization would be appropriate. After all, this is a conversation regarding the nature of Russia's fraught and uh, you can even say schizophrenic identity going back and forth between these seemingly contradictory ideas and inherent in ideas that to liberals would seem emancipatory, like the emancipation. Um, I see within it some attempt at the consolidation of orthodoxy, autocracy and nationality, but that's just me. Um, I know that especially regarding monarchical history, I have very revisionist takes, um, especially my uh, revisionist takes regarding Alexander II. Um, I do not believe that Alexander II was a, a great sort of liberal anomaly in between Nicholas I and Alexander III. I very much see him as representing some form of continuity, albeit with a inclination towards experimentation in the constitution, which irked Papa Donald C.F. Uh, Judge Kerry Bushman. <laughs> right. so, I, I oh, I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, I had, there were some questions I sort of tried to solicit in the chat, but absolutely, we can we can resume now. You're back. I mean, I don't mind answering the questions people have. So, uh... Uh, do you believe in the idea that cultures never truly change? I mean, czars all but in name like uh, Stalin and Putin? Well, I mean, both of those figures um, have both looked up to the Tsars of the past. So I guess in a non-monarchical sense, yeah. Is Belarusia an interesting, historically, is Ruthenia? Well, it's a bit of a quick, uh, uh, it's a bit of a uh, <laughs> trick question, King Jacques, because Belarusia, Belarus, is Ruthenia within the context of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, it didn't really discriminate. Um, Ruthenia then later came to mean a specific territory um, around the sort of East Galicia region when it was incorporated into the Austrian Empire uh, during the partitions, but um, that's a different tangent, I think. So um, yes, we were just finishing off Alexander II, and you did you want to move to Alexander III? Uh, yes. Yeah, so with Alexander III, um, so obviously he comes to the throne after his father was um, assassinated um, quite, quite brutally um, and, and traumatically. So uh, obviously with Alexander III, he's got his famous um, manifesto on unshakable autocracy um, and he's very much moving away from the idea of, of reform <clears throat> within Russia, Ru Russia itself. Um, so in terms also of expansion, uh, from my memory, I don't believe there's any significant expansion happens under him, um, from what I remember, or, or any wars for, for that matter of fact. Well, the clue is in the name. He was called the Pisar. Um, but, I mean, again, what do you really mean by expansionism? I mean, when I look to the reign of Alexander III, albeit it's brief, 13 years, and his death was a shock to Europe. He was only in his 40s when he died, and it's definitely fair to say that Nicholas II was unprepared. Um, when I look at, by the way, the Manifesto on Unshakable Autocracy, I very much view it within the purview of a traditional coronation oath, um, and very much that was the thinking of uh, Pobodonitsev. There was, you can say, an implicit anti-parliamentarianism in Russian thought, but now it has become explicit with Alexander III and his procurator of the Holy Synod. Um, whilst there are attempts to, you can say, mitigate 
the more sort of overarching effects of the abolition of serfdom. Yet at the same time, while Alexander III is trying to reform the village communities, he is expanding Russian railways, he is expanding Russian industry. You can say really it's under Alexander III that Russia really becomes an industrial power to some degree. And of course, after the 1894 Russo-French alliance, Russia becomes essentially a hive of uh, foreign market activity and investments uh, for international powers, most notably France, who are looking to the modernization, the industrialization and the increase in the infrastructure network as a means to facilitate Russia's mobilization directed at Germany. So there is definitely internal expansion expansion of the state, expansion of the economy and the efficiency of the Russian empire. And you can say that so long as Russia has internal stability and is able to project at least soft power abroad, then because of Russia's vast resources and potential that any foreign adventures like the foreign adventures of his son, Nicholas II, all they would do would damage the prestige of the dynasty and weaken Russia whilst it was benefiting from a post from a period of internal consolidation, indeed, that is proven so tragically with Nicholas II. Uh, yeah, so just going back to uh, the alliance with France, because it's also interesting, because um, as we know, this is post. Um, the Franco-Prussian War, so France is now a republic. So, so it, and also during this time, you've got the um, so the the alliance of the the League of the Free Emperors or the Dry Kaiserbund, um, which is an attempt to ally um, Germany, uh, Austria-Hungary, and Russia together. But um, Alexander the Third moves away from this and moves to this alliance with France. So it's sort of interesting that he's choosing to ally with Republican France. Then the um, other um, monarchical um, em empires in, in Europe. So he's purely doing this, I think, for strategic and pragmatic purposes and anything ideological. Well, I mean, if it was ideological, you could look at it as the apex of westernization, couldn't you? But uh, no, it was, it was definitely uh, geostrategic. He wasn't thinking so much as hostility towards Germany, albeit he was concerned with the you can say the rather flippant attitude of the Kaiser in not reconfirming the reinsurance treaty, which was seen as an act of hostility directed towards Russia. And of course, the implications of Russia allying with Austria, Austria and Russia, of course, being in a sense, bitter enemies since the great betrayal of the Crimean war, where Austria essentially didn't declare war on Russia, but essentially wanted to potentially join in with the coalition of powers that was fighting Russia at that time. So yes, it has to sort of be understood geostrategically, but of course it did have an effect in terms of, you could say, weakening the cause of monarchy in Europe by appealing above the two other crowned emperors of Europe, the Kaiser of Germany and the Emperor of Austria-Hungary to Republican France as Russia's ally. But of course it isn't you, you can say the ideological aspect in that is incidental. It doesn't become incidental when you look at how the course of the First World War pans out. Um, but as of this point, it is incidental. Whatever sort of uh, westernization may arise out of that is almost purely in the economic and military sphere. Yeah, so uh, before we move on to Nicholas II, and uh, World War One and the, the Revolution. Uh, this is the point where I actually want to go over the reading I had prepared for this. So, uh, so for the first reading, I wanted to uh, go over the idea of um, pseudomorphosis as outlined by um, Oswald Spengler in uh, Decline of the West, uh, because with this, he's mostly talking about um, Russia in the late 19th century. Uh, so. I'm just going to find my page one moment. Okay, so. so. In a rock stratum are embedded crystals of a mineral. Clefts and cracks occur. Water fil filters in. 
and the crystals are gradually washed out so that in due course only their hollow mold remains. Then, then come volcanic outbursts which explode the mountain. Molten masses pour in, stiffen and crystallize out in their turn. These are not free to do so in their own special forms. They must fill up the spaces that they find available. Thus there arise distorted forms, crystals whose inner structure contradicts their external shape. Stones of one kind presenting the appearance of stones of another kind. The mineralogists call this phenomenon pseudomorphosis. By the term historical pseudomorphosis, I propose to designate these cases in which an older alien culture lies so massively over the land that a young culture born in this land cannot get its breath, allows not only to achieve pure and specific expression forms, but even to develop fully its own self-consciousness. All that wells up from the depths of the young soul is cast in the old map moulds. Young feelings stiffen in seeing our works instead of rearing itself up in its own creative power. It can only hate the distant power of a hate that grows to be monstrous. So that was the initial sort of definition. Uh, so Spengler leans on this sort of uh, rock analogy um, to come up with pseudomorphosis. So essentially, because in his um, model, all cultures and civilizations are sort of isolated um, because Spengler is quite a hard relativist. So each civilization or culture has its own logic and they don't really influence each other except through pseudomorphosis. And there's only two cultures really that Spengler believes this has happened with the Magian civilization, which is uh, broadly speaking, the sort of the Middle East. So the Muslims, Arabs, uh, the Iranians, um, etc. But the other one is Russia. Uh, so there's another bit later on I would like to read. So this is a bit lengthier, AM. So uh, while I read this, feel free to interrupt me if you want to make any commentary. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just getting to the next page. Okay. A second pseudomorphosis is presented to our eyes today in Russia. The Russian hero tales of the Bailini culminated in the epic cycle of Prince Vladimir of Kiev, circa AD 1000, with his round table and in the popular hero, Ilya Muromayets. The whole immense difference between the Russian and the Faustian soul is already revealed in the contrast of these with the contemporary Arthur, Ermanaric and Nibelungen sagas of the migration period in the form of the Hildesbrand lead and Walfurville lead. The Russian Merovingian period begins with the overthrow of the Tatar domination by Ivan III, 1480, and passes by the last princes of the House of Rurik and the first of the Romanovs to Peter the Great, 1689-1725. It corresponds exactly to the period between Clovis, 485-511, and the Battle of Testri, 687, which effectively gave the Carolingians their supremacy. I advise all readers to read the Frankish history of Gregory of Tours to 591 in parallel with the corresponding parts of Karamzin's patriarchal narrative, especially those dealing with Ivan the Terrible and with Boris Gudunov and Vasily Shwisky. There could hardly be a closer parallel. The Muscovite period of the great Boyar families and patriarchs, in which a constant element is the resistance of an old Russia party to the friends of Western culture, is followed from the founding of Petersburg in 1703 by the pseudomorphosis, which forced the primitive Russian soul into the can alien I, mold. I just try and um, ex try, try to extrapolate what really he means here with mm -hmm. this Merovingian comparison with Muscovy. So obviously Clovis, if I recall, he is essentially nothing more than the head of a Frankish war band Franks, in, in the case of the Salian Franks, had been one of the first groups to be permitted to resettle west of the Rhine within the Roman Empire. Of course, by the time of Clovis, the Western Roman Empire has all but collapsed. The rump that exists is in the Kingdom of Soissons, which is northern France, which is essentially the heart of Western Rome, now that even Italy has been placed under the dominion of Odovaca. However, what Clovis does when he conquers the Kingdom of Soissons, so he is responsible for ending the Roman Empire, he's also responsible for reviving it, 
in the sense that the Clovician Empire, the Merovingian Empire, will go on from this nucleus of the now dead Western Roman Empire to form the Carolingian Empire and essentially the Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of France, which really, you can see, lead the Western element of European civilization onwards. In terms of trying to, and of course, we compare this and we talk about the Battle of Poitiers, we talk about the Muslim invasion. I think also in terms of what he means by looking at this ancient repressed civilization, we may be looking at a Frankish identity, a tribal identity, a Votan-esque pagan identity, which is now being enmeshed and sacrosized by the affiliation with the Catholic Church and Clovis's own ritualistic coronation, to the point that his successor dynasty, the Carolingians, will go on and they will essentially eliminate the last great vestiges of paganism in Europe through the war on the Saxons. If we're looking at Russia then, Russia has this traumatic experience in the breakup of the original civilization with the Muscovite, with not the Muscovite, the Rus fall at the behest of the Mongols. And then after that, we see a one hill fort in a obscure area of Russia, which had no sort of symbolic or <laughs> economic significance before, which is Moscow, which was given to a younger son of Alexander Nevsky, Daniel, and hence the Danilovich din uh, branch of the Rurikid dynasty. And that would form the nucleus of a new Muscovite state. You can say essentially like the Merovingian Empire, which will then reclaim the mantle of the Rus Imperium as Clovis would reclaim the mantle ultimately of the Roman Imperium. Do you think, just in terms of trying to understand and add legs to that comparison, do you think that's a fair reading of it? Um, no, I agree. And um, another way of looking at it is, to me, it feels like he's comparing the Merovingians so, sorry, sorry. He's con well, I should say is he's comparing the, um, was it the Rurikids before the Romanovs, the the dynasty? Yeah, right. Yes, he's sort of comparing the Rurikids to the Merovingians and the Romanovs to the Carolingians, essentially. Uh, I think that's sort of where, to me, the dynasty, the the, the comparison really breaks down, <laughs> um, because. <laughs> uh, Obviously, the Romanovs begin a period of internal consolidation, which you can say is like Charles Martel, um, which is, of course, looking at the great catastrophe of the uh, uh, the time of troubles and the brief Polish-Lithuanian occupation of Moscow. But in terms of the Carolingians really looking westward, um, I already believe the precedent was there under Clovis and what the Carolingians represent is simply a new dynasty taking over that trajectory. Whereas what happens to the Romanovs and, and Peter the Great, it seems to be going against the arc of even Romanov history. To put this in perspective, when Tsar Michael was made the first Romanov Tsar, I believe in the year 1613, uh, he had a father, um, if I remember again correctly, do forgive me, um, Patriarch Philaret or Metropolitan Philaret, who later becomes Patriarch Philaret. So Romanov Russia in the first reign was effectively that of the patriarch leading the Tsar. Very much in the case that when we look at uh, the reforms of Nikon in the reign of Alexis, it is very much again the patriarch leading the Tsar. And it's only really with the reign of Peter the Great that we see such a violent reaction to that. So I, I really sort of don't understand where the direct comparison would come in, other than you can say the superficial reading that the arc of the civilization is completed by a succeeding dynasty, i.e. Merovingian to Carolingian and Rurika to Romanov. Um, yeah, I think in a roundabout way I agree with you, AM, because um, with, with Spengler, um, obviously with his whole model, not all civilizations run concurrently, um, but they all have a, a logic and a structure to them. So what I think he's trying to do is essentially, so basically Russian culture has the same structure as the, the Western one, albeit it just happened at a later date in his, in his view, though, though I do agree that is a, 
that that is a little bit flawed. Well, I mean, to, to put this in perspective, Spengler was a mathematician, so it, it makes sense that within the context of his understanding, as he was a polymath, and you can say, you know, history was simply an aspect of his reading of all this and his desire to look into very strict models of understanding, of course, the cycle of civilization, thus equating with the decline of the West. I, I think looking in terms of the direct compare, I mean, he uses analogies and the idea of morphology, the idea of history is the history of becoming. There are elements of the now school in his thinking. So, for example, he iterates that the the history of the world is the history of cities, not the history of the great rural places. So at the same time, he's familiar with historiographical trends which are emerging by the beginning of the 20th century. But in terms of my model, I, I, I like to revel in the complexity <laughs> and I like buttressing analogies. But just from my own attempts at reading history and making sense of history, I think something is lost when you go into a subject with a particular understanding already formed and then you try to make the history conform i tend to find more satisfaction in the complexity and when the analogies do exist in some spenglerian sense i think they're all the richer for in some senses being unique as opposed to part of a prescribed novel uh, a prescribed model because mm, um because I feel um, that's a problem that comes up with um, Toynbee, who we'll get to later on as well. And I do think that some of his analogy, for example, I feel like he looks at what happened to the Roman Empire or Western culture and then tries to put that onto um, other cultures, such as the Indian and the Chinese, where they really where, where they really shouldn't be. But um, but we'll get to that later. Um, I want to carry on reading this um, passage. So, okay. Yeah, so by the pseudomorphosis, which forced the primitive Russian soul into the alien mould, first of full Baroque and then of the Enlightenment and then of the 19th century, the fate figure in Russian history is Peter the Great, with whom we may compare Charlemagne, who deliberately and with all his might strove to impose the very thing which Charles Martel had just prevented, the rule of the Moorish Byzantine spirit. The possibility was there of treating the Russian world in the manner of a Carolingian, or what, does, what, does he, what does he mean exactly by that? Because that's quite a big claim to make without a without um, contextualization. The Moorish Byzantine spirit. Does he literally mean that in the sense of transfiguring the Frankish state into an imperial model? Because of course, I, I'm sure he means by Moorish, he means Umayyad and the idea of the Halif as the elect of God in the same way that the Byzantine Empire claims universal dominion. Uh, because if that is the case, I think it's very superficial in the case of the Carolingian Empire. Well, that, I think that's what he's implicating, and I agree with you, because the thing is, going back to the Magians again, Spengler has this weird viewpoint that the Byzantines belong to the Magian culture, which I, I don't agree with, quite frankly. Um, so, yeah, it's a, yeah, I agree it's rather well, superficial. Well, as part of a broader point, he doesn't place the Byzantine cultures and the Russian cultures as part of a greater commonwealth either. And I think because of that, it, it somewhat sort of skews this understanding, especially if we're talking about Russian dualism. Uh, but I have to point out, if we're talking about a repressed soul, which is essentially fighting back against this pseudomorphosis, against the crystalline structure that has assumed something alien, quite departed from its original formation, is there a reason he doesn't say, for example, mention the old believers? Because you can say that the old believers are a wonderful example of this in the fact that we have a Russian Orthodox tradition, a particularistic tradition that has evolved its own set of rules, even down to the, this is the, the, the direct sort of contrast between the Nikon reforms and the old believers is even how to do the, the fundamental sign of the cross with three or two fingers. I just wonder, does he, would he see that, that old believer conflict with the Nikon reforms, which are attempting to bring Russia closer to the example of Greek orthodoxy, rather than allow Russia to go its own way? I, I would just be curious to see if he sees that as part of a trajectory of this repressed spirit and these alien reforms being imposed on it, because that would open up 
another example of Russian dualism in which we're looking at the Byzantine civilization, the Byzantine soul being imposed on Russia. And so even that, if we're looking at that as a possible angle, then we would have to dispense with symbols such as the double eagle, which you started off the stream as an intrinsically Russian symbol. And what are we left with? We're possibly left with St. George, but um, before then, maybe the icon of Vladimir himself, but even before then, what do you have? Um, the exploration of Rurik, I don't know, but um, it's an interesting angle to explore. Again, I... I, I relish in the complexity. So when he makes a point, I want to substantiate it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so Spengler is known, I think, for his sweeping statements. Um, regarding the old believers, um, I read this passage earlier, um, and I don't think he brings them up, unfortunately. But if, if he does, well, let's carry on. Uh, and then we can go off of that. So the possibility was there of treating the Russian world in the manner of a Carolingian or that of Seleucid that is, of choosing between Old Russian and Western ways, and Romanovs chose the latter. The Seleucids like to see Hellenes and not Aramaeans about them. Well, actually, choosing between Old Russian and Western ways, maybe that's a reference to the Old Believers, or...? I don't, I don't think so. I think he's referring to Peter the Great. Mm. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call uh, Orthodox um, Greece at this point, which is under Ottoman control, uh, Western-looking, really. Okay. Uh, so, the primitive Tsarism of Moscow is the only form which is even today appropriate to the Russian world, but in P Petersburg it was distorted to the dynastic form of Western Europe, the pull of the sacred south of Byzantium and Jerusalem, strong in every orthodox soul, was twisted by the worldly diplomacy which set its face to the west. The burning of Moscow, that mighty symbolic act of a primitive people, that expression of Maccabean hatred of the foreigner and heretic was followed by the entry of Alexander I into Paris, the Holy Alliance and the concert of the great powers of the West, and thus a nationality whose destiny should have been to live without a history for some generations, so it was forced into a false and artificial history that the soul of old Russia was simply incapable of understanding. Late period arts and sciences, enlightenment, social ethics, the materialism of world cities were introduced although in this pre-cultural time, religion was the only language in which man understood himself and the world. In the townless land with its primitive peasantry, cities of alien type fixed themselves like ulcers, false, unnatural, unconvincing. Petersburg, says Dostoevsky, is the most abstract and artificial city in the world, born it in it through, he, oh, sorry. So would do you want to say something? Um, well, well, again, a lot of things are thrown out there. Of course, it's convenient that he ignores Catherine the Great, because at the one point, we're looking at the foundation of St. Petersburg and the window in the West, which is a valid point. Yet at the same time, he then skips over that 100 years of Russian expansionism and ignores the fact that Catherine the Great was fully conscious of this idea of appealing to the Orthodox soul in Constantinople and thereby most of her expansionist policies with the expansion of ex exception of Polish, Poland, Lithuania, which I've argued consistently across many forums, is purely incidental. Um, she was aiming to that soul in Constantinople to the point where she looked on the restoration of Constantinople as part of Russia's destiny, essentially. So again, to make such sweeping statements, I find it it weakens and devalues this whole stretch of, um, uh, the you can say, the complicated policy making and the various influences of the Russian czars. And I think in following the model that ideas do not permeate, civilizational structures are rigid, therefore it's sort of very convenient to look at everything that is actually happening in terms of politics and whisk it all away and say that uh, this is simply a an alienation. This is simply an abstraction which has been imposed from above. Even with someone like Catherine the Great, I would definitely not say that, even though she is literally a German with no claim on the throne, being foisted into a position of artificial power off the back of the coup of her husband, who is also a German with very little understanding of Russia being placed in this position. So I find it interesting that despite the Bayron uh, of China, the rule of the Germans, 
throughout the earlier half of the 18th century, which comes after the reforms of Peter the Great, that someone who should be alien to the civilization, like Catherine the Great, can appeal to the West and the Enlightenment on the other on one hand, yet on the other, she can appeal to what Spengler himself identifies as the orthodox soul, as the longing for Constantinople. I will, however, buttress his idea that St. Petersburg is a rather artificial city in terms of the great sort of scope of the art of a Russian civilization. And I would very much see it as a dynastic, it's basically dynastic kitsch um, for the Romanovs. It is an imperial city. It is essentially an extension of the royal palaces and it fuels part of Peter the Great's own megalomania regarding his own very particularist conception, uh, a particular conception of what it means to be Russian. But it's not as if the Tsars were unaware of this fact. Um, increasingly, you can say throughout the 19th century, there is this friction between what is the spiritual capital of Russia, especially after the burning of Moscow. Is it Moscow where we receive our coronation or is it St. Petersburg? Of course, the Tsars resided in St. Petersburg, but even Catherine the Great would lament that Peter the Great should have chosen uh, Curzon in the south on the Black Sea, looking towards Constantinople as the real Russian capital. So I simultaneously agree with him, yet argue that the sweep is made more convenient by his obfuscation of certain facts. Mm -hmm. And um, so bringing up Catherine the Great, there's actually something I completely forgot when we were discussing uh, her earlier, because um, obviously we're talking about westernization and taking influence from the West. Well, obviously, as we know, during her reign, um, she allowed the settlement of several um, Germans, the Volga Germans, into, into Russia. Uh, so that also seems to be a part of that as well. What, what's your thoughts on that? Well, not just Volga Germans, Serbs, Greeks, um, anyone who is deemed economically productive. And besides the whole project of Nova Russia, it wasn't some sort of narrow uh, nationalistic idea of literally just creating Russia on the Black Sea coast. No, it was um, a desire to essentially build a civilization in Nova Russia, in Crimea, um, from the departing um, Ottoman scourge from their point of view. So, but but again, I don't, because I don't view history within a, a particularly sort of nationalistic lens. I look at this as the simple course of empire. So for example, the Byzantine empire, it wasn't ever really a Greek empire, even though towards the end, it had nothing more than Greek principalities attached to it, it would regularly move rebellious populations around within the empire and try and attract foreign mercenaries to fight its wars. Um, I simply see that as a part of the to and fro of empire building. Yes, because many other empires have, have done that, um, some more, more brutally and forcefully than others, but uh, thank you for, for your well, point. Well, you're on going that, to bring up Star, uh, Stalin later, aren't you? So it's perfect. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. So, uh, right. So, born in it, though he was, he had the feeling that one day it might vanish with the morning mist. Just so ghostly, so incredible were the Hellenistic artifact cities scattered in the Aramaic peasant lands. Jesus, in his Galilee, knew this. St. Peter must have felt it when he set his eyes on Imperial Rome. After this, everything that arose around it was felt by the true Ru Rustum as lies and poison. A true apocalyptic hatred was directed on Europe, and Europe was all that was not Russia, including Athens and Rome, just as for the Magian world in its time, Old Egypt and Babylon, had been antique, pagan, devilish. The first condition of emancipation for the Russian soul, wrote Aksakov in the 1863 to Dostoevsky, is that it should hate Petersburg of all its might and all its soul, Moscow was holy, Petersburg satanic. A widespread popular legend presents Peter the Great as Antichrist, just so the Aramaic pseudomorphosis cries out in all the apocalypses from Daniel and Enoch in Maccabean times to John, Baruch, and Ezra IV after the destruction of Jerusalem, against Antiochus the Antichrist, against Rome the Whore of Babylon, against the cities of the West with their refinement and their splendour, against the whole classical culture. All its works are untrue and unclean. 
the polite society, the clever artistry, the classes, the alien state with its civilized diplomacy, the justice and administration, the contrast between Russian and Western, Jew Christian and late classical nihilisms is extreme, the one kind is hatred of the alien that is poisoning the unborn culture in the womb of the land, the other a surfeited disgust of one's own proper overgrowths. Uh, I'm actually going to give my own comment after reading this. It seems a bit weird that he makes this comment because um, I've recently read some other parts of Decline of the West again recently, just sort of rereading over it. And in the introduction, he, Spengler makes the point of attacking people that try to make comparisons between um, modern sort of Western civilization and the ancient classical past. But, and, and he really rips into people for doing this. So it's amusing to see him do it now in this passage. Yes, yeah, so I know, but his, I mean, but to be honest, regarding Spengler, I mean, it is a very decline of the West, and it's uh, two volumes. It's a very, very long book. Um, so I can forgive the occasional sort of slight contradiction, but I mean, his his whole sort of understanding is that of, you know, history by analogy. So I, I don't really see that much of a problem. I think I do want to sort of, talk about what he has said though here which is the idea that moscow is holy and saint petersburg is satanic i have a a reading or like a commentary essentially on this which is um on my channel somewhere i think the episode is called um autocracy just called autocracy and um i talk about the confusion you can say arising what does saint petersburg represent what does moscow represent and i think if nothing else, St. Peter's work represented the patrimony of the Tsar directly. In that sense, you can say it's almost alien, alien to refer to St. Petersburg as the Antichrist, as the Tsar's home, in which case the Tsar himself, which Spengler says is the result of primitive Muscovite civilization, the home of the Tsar would simultaneously be the home of the Antichrist, which means he's no Tsar at all. And of course, within the context of Russian civilization, as you have Pope and anti-Pope within the Russian case, you have Christ and Antichrist as representing the Tsar and anyone who claims to be Tsar. So I guess in terms of directly associating the devil and Satan with St. Petersburg, I want to understand what the political contrast to that is if Russia is beholden to this primitive Tsarism, which is the only government which he believes it's appropriate for. Yet at the same time, if the Tsar decides to style this new city effectively a port version of Versailles, which you can say that was Peter the Great's ambition to begin with. And this wasn't really lost on the Tsars themselves. I mean, when Alexander II was assassinated in 1881, I think it had a seriously damaging effect on the prestige of St. Petersburg as the Russian Versailles. So when there is a church consecrated on the spilt blood, the church of the savior of spilt blood, which style is it in? It's not in the neoclassical style of St. Petersburg. It's in the Russian revivalist style, which is based on St. Basil's in Moscow. So you can say that there was an attempt to remedy this in the late 19th century by bringing a little bit of Moscow into St. Petersburg. Hmm. Because uh, I never thought that's come to mind with this whole idea of um, Petersburg being satanic again. I think he's drawing on, because obviously with pseudomorphosis, he's clearly implying that some sort of native Russian spirit is being strangled or by, by Western, what he calls Faustian culture. Obviously, Faustian is a reference because he's heavily indebted to um, Goethe. Um, but obviously, you've got the legend of Faustus, the man who sells his soul to Satan. So, again, that's possibly what he, he means by this. As sort of the Russian Tsars entering some sort of Faustian pact through Westernization. Um, possibly. But I think that, that that example is perhaps best reserved to someone like Lenin where the utopian parallels and the horrors that flow from it are really most apparent. Well, that's, uh, the, that's kind of where he goes um, further on, from what I remember. All right. Right, okay. Uh, just trying to find my place again, so... 
Uh, okay. Right, so the con... Yeah, so the one kind is the hatred of the alien as is poisoning the unborn culture in the womb of the land. The other, a surfeited disgust of one's own proper overgrowths. Depths of religious feeling, flashes of revelation, shuddering fear of the great awakening, metaphysical dreaming and yearning belong to the beginning as the pain of the spiritual clarity belongs to the end of a history. In the pseudomorphoses, they are mingled, says Dostoevsky. Everyone in streets and marketplace now speculates about the nature of faith. So might it have been said of Edessa or Jerusalem, those young Russians of the days before 1914, dirty, pale, exalted, moping in corners, ever absorbed in metaphysics, seeing all things with an eye of faith, even when the ostensible topic is the franchise, chemistry or women's education, are the Jews and early Christians of the Hellenistic cities, whom the Romans regarded with a mixture of surly amusement and secret fear. In Cyrus, Russia, there was no bourgeoisie, and in general no true class system, but merely, as in the Frankish dominions, lord and peasant. There were no Russian towns. Moscow consisted of a fortified residency, the Kremlin, round which was spread a gigantic market. The imitation city that grew up and ringed it, it in, like every other city on the soil of Mother Russia, is there for the satisfaction and utilities of the court, the administration, the traders, for that which lives in it is on the top, an embodiment of fiction, an intelligentsia, bent on discovering problems and conflicts and below, an uprooted peasantry, with all the metaphysical gloom, anxiety and misery of their own Dostoevsky, but perpetually homesick for the open land and busy hating the stony grey world into which Antichrist has tempted them. Moscow has had no proper soul, the spirit of the upper classes was western, and the lower had brought in with them the soul of the countryside. Between the two worlds there was no reciprocal comprehension, no communication, no charity. To understand the two spokesmen and victims of the pseudomorphosis, it is enough that Dostoevsky is the peasant and Tolstoy, the man of Western society. The one can never in his soul get away from the land, the other, in spite of his desperate efforts, can never get near it. Tolstoy is the former Russia, Dostoevsky is the coming Russia. The inner Tolstoy is tied to the West. He is the great spokesman of Petrinism, even when he is denying it. The West is never without a negative. The guillotine, too, was a true daughter of Versailles, and rage as he might against Europe, Tolstoy though he can never shake it off. Hating it, he hates himself, and so becomes the father of Bolshevism. The utter powerlessness of this spirit, and its 1917 revolution, stands confessed in his posthumously published A Light Shines in the Darkness. This hatred Dostoevsky does not know. His passionate power of living is comprehensive enough to embrace all things Western as well. I have two fatherlands, Russia and Europe. He has passed beyond both Petrinism and revolution, and from his future he looks back over them as from afar. His soul is apocalyptic, yearning, desperate but of this future certain. I will go to Europe, says Ivan Karamazov to his mother, Alyosha. I know well enough that I will or shall be going only to a churchyard. But I know too that the churchyard is dear, very dear to me. Beloved dead lie buried there. Every stone over them tells of a life so ardently lived, so passionate a belief in its own achievements, its own truth, its own battle, its own knowledge. That I know, even now I know. I shall fall down and kiss these stones and weep over them. Tolstoy, on the contrary, is essentially a great understanding, enlightened and socially minded. All that he sees about him takes the late period, megalopolitan, a Western form of a problem, whereas Dostoevsky knows not even know what a problem is. Tolstoy is an event within and of Western civilization. He stands midway between Peter and Bolshevism, and neither he nor these manage to get within sight of Russian Earth. The thing they are fighting against reappears, recognisable, in the very form in which they f fight. Their kind of opposition is not apocalyptic but intellectual. Tolstoy's hatred of property is an economist, his hatred of society are social reformers, his hatred of the state are political theorists, hence his immense effect upon the West. He belongs in one respect as in another, to the band of Marx, Ibsen and Zola. Dostoevsky, on the contrary, belongs to no band, unless it be the band of the apostles of primitive Christianity. His demons were denounced by the Russian intelligence 
Intelligentsio's reactionaries that he himself was quite unconscious of such conflicts. Conservative and revolutionary were terms of the West that left him indifferent. Such a soul as his can look beyond everything that we can that we call social, for the things of this world seem to it so imp- unimportant as not to be worth improving. No genuine religion aims at improving the f- world of facts. And Dostoevsky, like every primitive Russian, is fundamentally aware of that world and lives in a second metaphysical world beyond. What has the agony of the soul to do with communism, a religion that has got as far as taking social problems in in hand to cease to be a religion? But the reality in which Dostoevsky lives, even during this life, is a religious creation directly present to him. His Alyosha has defined all literary criticism, even Russian. His life of Christ, had he written it, as he always intended to do, would have been a genuine gospel, like the gospels of primitive Christianity, which stand completely outside classical and Jewish literary forms. Tolstoy, on the other hand, is a master of the Western novel. Anna Karenina distances every rival, and even in his peasant's garb remains a man of polite society. Here we have beginning and end clashing together. Dovsievsky is a saint, Tolstoy only a revolutionary. From Tolstoy, the true successor of Peter, and from him only proceeds Bolshevism, which is not the contrary, but the final issue of Petrinism, the last dishonouring of the metaphysical but the social, and ipso facto a new form of the pseudomorphosis. If the building of Petersburg was the first act of Antichrist, the self-destruction of the society formed of that Petersburg is the second, and so the peasant soul must feel it, for the Bolshevists are not the nation, or even a part of it, but the lowest stratum of this Petrine society, alien and western like the other strata, yet do not recognise by these and consequently filled with the hate of the downtrodden. It is all megapolitan and civilised. The social politics, the intelligentsia, the literature that first is in the romantic and then in the economic jargon champions freedoms and reforms before an audience that itself belongs to the society. The real Russian is a disciple of Dostoevsky. Although he may not have read Dostoevsky or anyone else, Nay, perhaps because he cannot read. He is him is himself Dostoevsky in substance. And if the Bolshevists, who see in Christ a mere social revolutionist like themselves, were not intellectually so narrowed, it would be in Dostoevsky that they would recognise their prime enemy. What gave this revolution its momentum was not the intelligentsia's hatred, it was the people itself, which without hatred, urged only by the need of throwing off a disease, destroyed the old Westernism in one effort of upheaval and will send the new after it, after it in another. For what this town, this people yearns for in its own life form, its own religion, its own history. Tolstoy's Christianity was a misunderstanding. He spoke of Christ and he meant Marx, but to Dostoevsky's Christianity, the next a thousand years will belong. Right, so after reading all of that, so the, the point there as Bolshevism being some logical extreme of Petrinism. I can see where he's coming from, but I do think it's a bit of an exaggeration, because um, I agree Bolshevism is, is satanic, considering what they did. But, I mean, if Peter the Great could have seen what they did, I think he would have been completely disgusted. I mean, what's your thoughts, Sam? I... I mean, on one hand, I need to acknowledge that it's a a beautiful composition, literary composition that Spengler has put out there. But it's not a history. In order to really grasp what he means regarding Dostoevsky's equivalency with a primitive Christianity, the idea of Dostoevsky as representing the soul of Russia and Dostoevsky as representing the saint, whereas Tolstoy is a mere revolutionary. As someone who is, you know, rather familiar with Tolstoy, the claims, you could say, the claims are of a, a Western superficiality ring quite true with Tolstoy. Yet at the same time, this isn't, for me at least, a conversation on literature, so I don't feel prepared enough to elucidate that. I almost feel derisively saying that (laughs) Spengler isn't going to elaborate either, so why should I? Um, But regarding Dostoevsky, he brings up, as again, it's my problem with reading Spengler, wonderful sweeping statements, which I really want to chew on and I really want to substantiate. But as is 
the case with the decline of civilization, which is so grand and overarching in scale, but lacking in these details which I need in order to understand and frame a cogent argument. I can't really say, but again, I would need to be an expert in Dostoevsky and also an expert in the context in which he's writing to really understand that. Regarding the idea that Peter represents some sort of ideology which leads to Bolshevism, but again, it's at the one st at, the, at the one point you can say that it's almost Carlylean that the revolution was brought upon itself by the corruption of a putrid and alien faction. However, I don't see this hate which he attributes to pseudomorphosis as being directed by the disenfranchised Russian peasantry towards the Western elites. I see this as a contest between Western systems effectively. And I see that the Tsarist system is not really even that, that much of a Western system. It is something which, especially under Tsar Nicholas II, is trying to re-imbue with a sense of, you can say, that core ideology of what it means to be Russian. I mean, just look, say, for example, of the, uh, the land leagues, the Black Hundreds, etc., the reforms of Stolypin, the idea of turning Russia into an empire of peasant smallholders rather than serfs. I really think before the First World War, there was an attempt to reconcile the relationship between Tsar and peasant against the urban bourgeoisie. Even though he mentions the fact that Russia didn't have a class system, the class system as we know it, it comes out of the ideas of the three estates, the church, the nobility, and the third estate, meaning everyone else. Really, I mean, it came during the French Revolution to be lawyers, but after the French Revolution, it came to be financiers. So the model of the estates, which is working on the class system, is post-French Revolution. But of course, Russia didn't have a French Revolution, nor was it so economically developed as to generate a mass urban culture. I still believe even today that isn't the case. So I think, again, in terms of the analogy, I struggle to really understand what he means. I mean, regarding his interpretation of Moscow, if I were to remember correctly, which is that Moscow is a citadel surrounded by a market who ex which is, exists essentially to supply the court. That to me, even though that may have been true, especially in the early days of um, Ivan money bags, I don't believe that was true at all by the time of Ivan the Terrible, when Russia adopted, in his words, primitive Tsardom, which again, I don't look at Tsardom as a primitive system. I don't look at it as a pure despotism, um, like he's referring to, even though it may appear superficially to be one. That definition, the idea of essentially the court city of Sarai, which in Persian just means the court, which was a name attributed to the essentially the capital of the Golden Horde. I think it's very much leaning on this idea that you can say Russia is a horde empire based on that of the Tatar model, which he's only sort of tentatively brought up. And so I'm familiar with this historiographical sort of narrative, which is trying to imbue with Russia that is essentially anti-urban, pro-rural, but I don't see the trajectory towards Bolshevism being a revolt of the rural against the Western elite. I don't see that at all. I see quite the opposite. When we look at the Petrograd Soviet and when we look at the Russian Revolution, it is very much a revolt of a small clique and a military elite backing them, not to mention the most military elite backing them, the uh, uh, Preminovsky and uh, Brezhensky regiments. And indeed, the um, Kronstadt Marines. I, I again, I, I also don't see the Petrine reforms as resulting in Bolshevism. I think again, it's convenient to look at history as a trajectory, a set trajectory. But I see any number of things that could have arisen out of the First World War, and it was a very, very specific set of coincidences that led to the rise of Bolshevism. Indeed, I think Lenin, what is so fascinating about Lenin is that he represents, I would almost say, the purest expression of the great man. 
the man who was able to build a new form of government based on nothing than sheer coercion. And I really do mean that. And therefore, to see the trajectory from Peter to Lenin, I think, is completely absurd. <clears throat> no, no, certainly, I, I agree uh, that it, it is absurd. So again, just going over Spengler's model, um, again, for my, my reading of it, because uh, this is a recurring theme in decline, that he talks about the uh, the Fellahin principle being a, an Arabic word for the um, the landed and peasantry, um, and their conflicts with the, the, the with the world city. Uh, the so just to clarify, from what you said, um, you do you believe that he's saying that the peasants were the reason for the rise of Bolshevism, or have I misunderstood you? No, I, I think what he's trying to say is that if the peasant is the true soul of Russia and the peasant is trapped in this process of pseudomorphosis, that its nature and that of Russian civilization represents a form of alienation. Of course, this is consistent with his idea that the, the trajectory of history is the history of the world city, that history is only the history of becoming when focused on the city, but the agrarian remains essentially the same. But when this example is brought to Russia, I wonder if he means this in a more generalist sense, or does he mean this, that Russia cannot have an urban culture because of what he identifies essentially as the particular instance of Moscow. And I, I don't really understand. And I, when I'm looking at this example of the revolt of the peasantry, he's identifying the Russian soul with the peasantry. So when he looks at this revolt against the Tsarist government, which has become contaminated with the Antichrist in St. Petersburg, what other conclusion can I make other than he means the soul of Russia revolting against it in the form of the peasantry? But of course, that just wasn't the case. Uh, no, certain, certainly, and well, well, again, I, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, but in in with the lack of evidence to substantiate his points, and uh, again, the, the the decline and fall of um of Western civilization is uh, the decline and fall of the West, rather. It's essentially again a a grand narrative. I I don't look at it as a history. I find it rather informing on a abstract and uh, historiographical level but um again i need because i'm fastidious regarding these things i would like to see his points substantiated with clear crisp examples and I, again i feel that when you reduce broad aspects of history to these very reductionist concepts I am left scratching my head in terms of really trying to identify what his original meaning was regarding this, regarding the trajectory of Peter to Lenin, and because I think there, because I think there is there is an element of truth here, in which I see it best exemplified with something that he hasn't brought up, which means the old believers is an example of that, which is an organization which was pushed underground and indeed remained underground. There was no real attempt during the remainder of Tsarist Russia and Imperial Russia, if you're going to make that distinction, which ever reconciled the old believers. Even Nicholas I didn't reconcile the old believers. So in terms of a pertinent example, I would bring that up. In terms of like the, what, how does the emancipation of the serfs fit into this? How does the village community sit into this? How do the reforms to the village communities fit in? How do the pogroms fit into this? I mean, Tsar Nicholas II, for example, he didn't condone them, he didn't facilitate them, but he believed that it represents some form of um, organic peasant resistance towards alien influences, which Oswald Spinkler would recognize. In that sense, you can say the Tsar, despite being resident in the satanic capital, was also sympathetic towards a sort of simple peasant understanding, which is also illiterate. So I apologize, I'm scratching my head and I'm trying to make sense of this um, this grand sweep, uh, sweeping narrative. And also I think I really need to go back and I need to 
<laughs> become expert in Russian and Dostoevsky in order to clarify his points. And unfortunately, I do not find myself in a position to be able to do that. Well, thank you for your analysis anyway, I, I am. And um, I think the issue here, again, is it's Spengler's sort of chronic pessimism that comes through, um, which is why he makes this line from Petrinism to Bolshevism. Oh, I, 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 can be, I don't mind him being a pessimist. I would just prefer it if he was accurate. <laughs> yeah, it's just the, the logic of, of, of his mind. And... Um, and um, Judge Caligula Bushman in the chat, Spengler is dense. <laughs> yeah, he is. So there's something rather interesting, a, a, a point being made in the chat by one King Jacques, which is strange how many great men of the 20th century happen to be communists. Seems paradoxical. Well, it, actually, it doesn't seem paradoxical at all. Of course, one of the contradictions regarding Marxism is that it is supposed to go beyond the idea of despotism. It is supposed to go beyond the idea of monarchy. but because of the nature of Marxism, because it is so antithetical to nature, it is so antithetical to civilization, and it is so theoretical in terms of its implementation, it is just the sort of ideology which attracts great men because it enables essentially hum, hum, essentially the human spirit, whatever that means, to transcend everything, to conform everything to a scripture, to a party line, to a secular religion. And in this case, Lenin was a great man because he was able to take something as complex and storied as Russia, and he was able to impose upon it a truly alien model of government which hadn't been tried anywhere else before. And he was able to sustain it through pure coercion, through pure power through using every Machiavellian means to coerce the population into accepting, into being subjugated into this new state, something which would only be augmented under Stalin with the creation of the planned economy, with the various purges, and with, of course, the collectivization of the farms, which very much, you can say, takes the spirit of the reform movements regarding the peasantry breaks them, reformulates them, and creates a harsher version of feudalism than perhaps ever existed in Russia before. And you can say this is also equivalent with Mao at the same way, because Mao is inhabiting a ancient civilization, a storied civilization like Russia. And he is similarly able to impose a vision on China, which was rejected before and really which was rejected since, since Deng Xiaoping. You know, in contrast to someone like Stalin, who was a central planner, I look at Mao as basically being an anarchist. He thrives in the power, which is beholden essentially to these um, ungovernmental forces, these undirected forces like the young pioneers, all this zeal whereby China, through an exuberance, over exuberance through personality, will be able to industrialize almost instantly during the Great Leap Forward. I think it requires a certain combination of delusion, detachment for reality, and the belief that human beings can do anything, that anything is possible. There are no limits, either natural or in any way superimposed by scripture or this belief in the divine. It is necessarily man reaching out to grab the fire of Prometheus. And therefore, I think it is just the ideology which creates great men. And I muse great men only in the sense that these are the men who make history, not in the sense that they did anything beneficial for the people who were living under them or were good in any sort of strictly moralistic sense. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, um, I am not certainly a, um, an interesting question by King, King Jacques that, that you've um, answered adroitly. Um, so one other point I wanted to make, uh, one last point on Spengler. So it's interesting there that he says that he believes the future of Russia um, is Dostoevsky's vision, which is, was interesting because from my understanding, obviously you've talked about Stalin there completely um, crushing 
Russia's rural peasantry with the collectivization. If anything, this prediction of Spengler, I think, is completely wrong. Well, I'd like to understand what he means. I mean, is he pessimistic in the sense that he believes that this spirit is doomed to be perpetually crushed because of the primitive nature of Russian civilization within the scope of the history becoming these grand morphologies? So does he believe this sort of thing is inevitable because the Russian civilization is embryonic, is not fully formed? Or was he wrong in predicting that the Bolsheviks would lead to some sort of grand agrarian uprising? Because if you're going to look for political programs, you have to look to the green movement or even the social revolutionaries who had far more support among the peasantry outside of Petrograd, as opposed to the Soviets, which again, literally means workers' councils who were overly overly sort of represented in the big cities. So as with everything Spengler, this to me needs more, it, it means more legs, it needs legs to stand on, it needs substantiation, because it's a fascinating hypothesis, but I can't confirm it one way or the other. So it might as well essentially be a moot point. <laughs> Yeah, so to go back to Judge Cloper, Bushman, Bushman Spengler is, is dense, if only he wasn't so dense, but um, that's enough of him. So so for this next um, bit, I want to read a passage from Toynbee. Now, this passage from Toynbee is significantly shorter than the Spengler one, though he makes some similar points, so just need to get the page. Okay, so the only semblance of an effective external challenge to our society since the Osman Lee's second failure to take Vienna has been the challenge of Bolshevism, which has confronted the Western world since Lenin and his associates made themselves masters of the Russian Empire. Oh, in just, just for a little thing for the audience, Osman Lee, of course, means Ottoman in 1683, um, though I do like the fact that he uses the more... Uh, politic term which is more uh <laughs> more accurate so to speak as opposed to the confused etymology but yeah just a quick note um, yes um, that's actually one thing i like about toynbee is he uses these um very um sort of unique um terms for everything well, well they aren't they aren't unique i mean it's a it's sort of a rite of passage when you enter academic history that you um you undergo a process where you write in a way that's mutually intelligible to those who you're talking to but unintelligible to everyone else <laughs> um, maybe unique's not the, not the right word but um, anywho i'll move on so okay since then our modern western expansion has been literally worldwide and for the time being at any rate the expansion has relieved us completely from our old preoccupation with challenges from alien human societies the only semblance of an effective external challenge to our society. Oh, hang on, I've lost, lost my place. One moment. Okay. So, sorry, the challenge of Bolshevism, which has confronted the Western world since Lenin and his associates made themselves masters of the Russian Empire in 1917, yet Bolshevism has not yet threatened the ascendancy of our Western civilization very far beyond the borders of the USSR. And even if one day the communist dispensation was to, were to fulfill the Russian communist hopes by spreading all over the face of the planet, a worldwide triumph of communism over capitalism, but not mainly triumph of an alien culture, since communism, unlike Islam, itself derived from the Western source, being a reaction from and a criticism of the Western capitalism that it combats. The adoption of this exotic Western doctrine as the revolutionary creed of 20th century Russia so far from signifying that Western culture is in jeopardy, really shows how potent its ascendancy has come to be. There is a profound ambiguity in the nature of Bolshevism which is manifested in Lenin's career. Did he come to fulfil or destroy the work of Peter the Great? In retransferring the capital of Russia from Peter's eccentric stronghold to a central position in the interior, Lenin seems to be proclaiming himself the successor of the archpriest Avakum, and the old believers and the Slavophiles. Here we might feel it is a prophet of holy Russia, embodying the reaction of the Russian soul against the Western civilization. Yet when Lenin casts about for a creed, 
he borrows from a westernized German Jew, Karl Marx. It is true that the Marxian creed comes nearer to a total repudiation of the Western order of society than any other creed of Western origin, which a 20th century Russian prophet can never could have adopted. It was the negative and not the positive elements in the Marxian creed that made it congenial to a Russian revolutionary mind. And this explains why in 1917, the still exotic apparatuses of Western capitalism in Russia was overthrown by an equally exotic Western anti-capitalist doctrine. This explanation is borne out by the metamorphosis which this Marxian philosophy appears to be undergoing in the Russian atmosphere, where we see Marxism being converted into an emotional and intellectual, intellectual substitute for Orthodox Christianity, with Marx for its Moses and Lenin for its Messiah, and their collected works for the scriptures of this new atheistic church militant. But the phenomena take on a different aspect when we turn our attention from faith to works and examine what Lenin and his successors have actually been doing to the Russian people. So you want to make a point? Well, if it's convenient to do so. Um, I think one needs to draw a line between Marxism and Marxism-Leninism because Marxism-Leninism is a very particular interpretation of Marxism. Marxism believes in a deterministic theory of history, a materialistic deterministic theory of history, that various class societies will ultimately result in the triumph of the proletariat socialism as by way of ultimately appealing to the utopia that is communism. In order to do that, one needs to break through feudalistic and capitalistic molds of civilization. During the, I believe it was the 1903 Social Democratic Party conference, the Social Democratic Party broke off into two factions. One, the Mensheviks, uh, led by Julius Martov, who believed that in following a very strict Marxist interpretation, that Russia was simply not conducive to the conditions which allow for a Marxian revolution. In contrast to this, Lenin postulated the idea that revolution could be achieved through an elite vanguard, a vanguard of revolutionaries, which would establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. In other words, what Marxism-Leninism represents is not a pure importation of a Western idea, but it's a Western idea which has been, before it becomes essentially ascendant in Russia, modified for the unique circumstances within Russia itself. So already there are aspects of you can say counter czarism and counter bourgeoisie in terms of the primitive development of a urban civilization in Russia up until that point, which counteract the more doctrinaire Marxists in the Menshevik movements. That's an important point to note. Regarding what Toynbee represents as the ambiguities of Bolshevism, when Lenin comes to power, you see sweeping attempts to completely remodel the whole society and state of Russia through the emancipation of women, quote unquote, the liberalization of abortion, uh, liberal changes to education, legalization of homosexuality, women's inter you know, international day, et cetera, et cetera. However, towards the end of Lenin, we see hints that there is some pushback against the infallibility of communism. Indeed, as Deng Xiaoping would later modify Ma uh, Maoism and say that he's adopting socialism with Chinese characteristics. As this seemingly hostile Western importation is thrust into Russia, albeit already redesigned effectively to take power in Russia, which it does so very successfully, albeit at a huge material and cost of life, Vladimir Lenin understands that it's not simply enough to impose this doctrinaire view of Marxism on people. And so he adopts the new economic policy to roll back on this aspect of the dictatorship of the proletariat and allow some primitive elements of capitalism to play again in the Russian economy. When I look at someone like Stalin, I do not see Stalin as a breach in this model. I see the Stalin as the fullest representation of Leninism in terms of this casual expediency and this prioritization of power above all else. And this is power in the Russian context. So although Stalin is responsible for the collectivization, Stalin 
is able to establish a red autocracy. And I would argue an autocracy which is more perfect than anything which had been established by the Tsars, because it is a autocracy which is beholden to nothing more than an abstract ideology upon which it's founded. It's not really beholden to a constituency. It is sustained by fear in a way that I would say none of the Russian Tsars came close except Ivan the Terrible. Ivan the Terrible, which Stalin actually decided to consciously emulate, it should be noted. But what Stalin represented was a pushback against more doctrinaire aspects of Marxism, especially on the nationalistic level if we're talking about Russian civilization. At first, it would seem that Marxism-Leninism was anti-Russian civilization because of the desire for the Soviet Union to be a truly cosmopolitan civilization. The idea that the Soviet Union was simply the nucleus for a world socialist government. And in that sense, all of the nationalities within the Soviet Union would be given some form of fuller expression and demarcation, which didn't death certainly didn't exist during the time of the Tsars. However, by the time of Stalin, there is an understanding that the situation in Russia no longer makes that practicable. So instead, we're going to roll back on this idea of utopian internationalism, which had guided the original, uh, the original communists indeed his adversary Trotsky. And so we see this readoption of a rather conventional, you can say in the mold of Alexander III, Russian, not only foreign policy, but Russification in the domestic sphere as well. And so when I look at Stalin, you know, people say that he betrayed the revolution. In some sense he did, because socialism in one country is antithetical to the idea of the vertical relationship, where it's not nationalities competing against one another, it's simply classes. It is a matter of the classes unifying into a form where they can express themselves on a global stage, thus inaugurating the worldwide socialist state, which would lead towards communism in a utopian sense. In eschewing that and going for a practically minded socialism in one country, the Soviet Union thereby sets it up for the rest of the 20th century as a red Russian empire. And so I would say that, just to quickly summarize my point, Marxism in the abstract is completely alien to Russian civilization. I would agree with that. And the idea that Marx could have predicted that the Russian revolution would have happened is absurd. However, Marxism-Leninism was ready-made and adapted for the situations, the particular situations that had existed in Russia, in contrast to the German Social Democratic Party and the Fabians in England, German Social Democratic Party, of course, in Germany. And Stalin continued along that trajectory to russify Marxism-Leninism to a point where Marx wouldn't have recognized it. Thank you. And um... <laughs> The whole Stalin and Ivan the Terrible will we'll come to that in a bit as well. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to finish reading this passage. There's not much left. So, uh, But the phenomena take on a different aspect when we turn our attention from faith to works and examine what Lenin and his successors have actually been doing to the Russian people. And we ask ourselves, what is the significance of Stalin's five-year plan? We can only answer that it was an effort to mechanize agriculture as well as industry and transport to change a nation of peasants into a nation of mechanics, to transform the old Russia into a new America. In other words, it was a latter-day attempt at westernization, so ambitious and radical, and ruthless that it put peace of the great work into the shade. The present rulers of Russia are working with the demonic energy to ensure the triumph in Russia of the very civilization that they are denouncing in the world at large. No doubt they dream of creating a new society which will be American in equipment but Russian in soul, uh, this is a strange dream to be dreamed by a statesman for whom a materialist interpretation of history is an article of faith. On Marxian principles, we must expect that if a Russian peasant is taught to live the life of an American mechanic, he will learn to think as the mechanic thinks, to feel as he feels, and desire what he desires. In this tug of war which we are witnessing in Russia between the ideals of Lenin and the methods of Ford, we may look forward to seeing the ascendancy of the Western over the Russian civilization paradoxically confirmed. So, well, that's the end of the passage. So, some of you may have thought it was a bit strange why I had an image of Henry Ford up on this here, but that's the reason because of this mention to the 
this sort of weird fusion between the ideals of American capitalism and Fordism with Russian Bolshevism. I mean, do you have any particular view on that, MAM? Well, if this is taken from a study of history, obviously a study of history was written across a long time. It, it doesn't really appear weird. Again, I, I would like to know the specific year, but um, it doesn't really appear weird, weird to me at all because this is essentially <laughs> this is essentially Aldous Huxley, isn't it? This is Henry Fordism with people named after Lenina. You know, it's just um, it's taking aspects of the mechanization, the the revolution, the industrial revolution, magnifying it, streamlining it, and be able to extend the assembly line to everything, including the human hatcheries that exist in a brave new world. So in a purely mechanistic sense, I can understand where Toynbee is coming from. But again, I, other than like Spengler does, equivocating the Russian soul with some intrinsic sort of rural spirit. I, again, I, I look at this as almost a purely materialistic version of history. And ironically, I also apply this to Spengler. The idea that Peter the Great wanted to quote unquote, modernize Russia. He wanted to endow Russia with a Western Navy. He wanted to bring in Western manufacturers. The idea was then extended by Catherine the Great. Thereby he wanted to mobilize the Russian economy, so to speak. Well, again, um, within a ma purely materialistic framework, you can say that there is some trajectory from Peter the Great to Alexander the Third to Lenin to Stalin. However, I think I I'm not really f satisfied by that purely sort of materialistic delineation. All of those men, including the distinction, subtle distinction between Lenin and Stalin, albeit I believe, as I've said, that Stalin was operating under the same trajectory, would essentially inaugurating partial modernization for different reasons. So, for example, you take Alexander III. Would you say that his desire to reorganize and turn the peasant into a essentially a paramilitary force for the Tsar? Would you say, say, for example, that that was completely incompatible with the idea that Russia should have a modern infrastructure, a modern army that was capable of fighting a war, a European war against Germany? I don't think he would have found there to be a great distinction there. As for Stalin and the idea of the mechanization of agriculture, the idea of the collective collectivization of the farmland, again, I see this as having a pattern in Russian history with the Oplichtina in the instance of Ivan the Terrible, the idea of taking a free moving people and subjugating them to political lackeys, apparatchniks, or a new feudal order. I almost see it as analogous, for lack of a better word. So I see Stalin represents some aspects of eternal Russian civilization and the mechanization to me almost seems incidental. What this really comes down to is power. Peter the Great wanted to impress Russian power on the world stage. And to that, for some, for some reason, therefore, he was accused of being the Antichrist. Stalin ultimately disabused himself of a purely doctrinaire understanding of Marxism in the historical sense. And he was concerned with the impression of Soviet power on the European stage, understanding in the Machiavellian sense that the projection, the projection of pure power outwards could ensure that the boundaries of the Soviet Union after the Second World War were protected with the occupation of East Germany, Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, etc. Indeed, you can say that Alexander I would have only dreamt of this idea of the buffer states that Stalin established after the Second World War. So I see many of these parallels, and I hate to use this overly reductionist sort of view back to mechanization. However, I will say in Toy B's favor that this is also a point echoed by Julius Eveler when he talks about the triumph of the third estate in America and the fourth estate, and he doesn't mean the fourth estate in terms of the press, but he means the fourth estate in terms of the proletariat in Russia. 
thereby Russia and the United States effectively represent two sides of the same coin, both materialist, both anti-hierarchical. But given my understandings about the intricacy of Bolshevism, I find elements of that view quite unsatisfying. I mean, let, let me move away from Russia and just look at Romania, for example. Romania, during the 1960s, was one of the most doctrinaire Stalinist countries in the world, yet it was also one of the most ferociously nationalistic. In fact, there's a word that comes out of that period in Romanian history, which is called protochronism. The nationalism, which is so fervent that everything that was worth inventing had a Romanian origin. So I think that's the sort of fascinating thing. You can say that Marxism has a purely sort of materialistic element to it, which is certainly true. And in terms of a more doctrinaire sense, you can look at Stalin and say nationalism is nothing more than, they can, than an economic market. Yet at the same time, Stalin understood the need to create saints out of socialism, heroes out of socialism, to create gods in the form of Lenin. And so even though this wouldn't be credited within the official historiography, I think all of these aspects of Russian history are in some way analogous and playing on much older precedents. And thus going back to my original point that I see this conflict within Russian civilization, this dualism as ever present and fluid. Oh. Yes, and um, sort of just going back to this idea of making saints out of um, socialism and trying to create some sort of sort of myth for for Soviet Russia. Um, again, I know I agree with you. Stalin was the the heir to Lenin, and the cult. You know, if Lenin had lived longer, he would have pretty much have done the same thing that, that Stalin did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the next thing I want to do, and, and also you mentioned Julius Evola, I was actually tempted to include a reading from Revolt Against the Modern World, but I think after the um, the passages I've just read, I think we've, there's been enough um, reading. So uh, just going to pull up the next slide. So with um, the Bolshevik re Revolution, um, as we know, there was a... Um, Obviously, the Civil War, the the Reds and the Whites, with the uh, the Whites losing and the Reds establishing a sort of a dictatorship, the the, the dictatorship of the proletariat. I just want to ask you something. Um, um, I, um, so, with the the sort of the, the White forces against against the Reds, um, obviously, what they the Whites stood for was completely op the opposite of what the Bolsheviks wanted. So. I sort of have it in my head that the, the whites constituted one part of Russia, uh, the the old and the reds, some sort of new new Russia. I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that? Um, I hesitate to assign the whites any clear ideology, as I would with the Bolsheviks. Nothing as clearly thought of, delineated, or indeed executed. When looking at people such as you know Kolchak and the idea of forming some sort of Russian state with himself as supreme leader, you know people can just say proto-fascism. But what really does that mean? Were they simply for the restoration of the Tsar? Were they for the restoration of an autocracy? Were they for the creation of a parliamentary democracy? Were they simply anti-Bolshevik? Were they fighting primarily for the Church? Were they fighting, say, for example, the Cossacks? Were they fighting for autonomy and independence in the way the Soviet Union was intent on crushing them? And the white movement wasn't Russian either. The white movement was international. The white movement included Kubans, it included Georgians, Armenians, Ukrainians, Finns, and I would very much include the successful revolutions against Bolshevism in the Baltic countries and the defeat of Trotsky at the hand of Pilsudski as part of the broader white revolution, because contained within the paradox of the whites was this idea of balancing these regional identities who resented 
total domination from St. Petersburg, now Moscow, and this idea of restoring the Russian Empire. Had the white movement actually won, and I think that's very unlikely in any historical context based on counterfactuals, I think the Russian Empire would have disintegrated anyway. And I can't say whether the Tsar would have been restored to a point of view of autocracy if he had been restored at all. Maybe in terms of a pure abstract, they collectively represent, you can say, the muddle that has come out of this aggressive force of world communism, Marxism, Leninism. But I think the idea which Nicholas II was so intent on leaving untrammeled to his son, the Tsarevich Alexis, was already broken during the course of the First World War. And what you see in the white movement, but not just the white movement, what you see now is an attempt to very reconciling that legacy of the failure of Nicholas II and what that, the implications of that for the Russian right. How Stalin reconciled that was essentially becoming the Red Tsar. How someone like Putin recognizes that is by becoming a Kolchak. I think you could even, if you look at um, Kolchak, there's even a resemblance between Putin and Kolchak. You're right, I, I can see it. But um, unlike Kolchak, Putin is actually quite successful. And Putin remains in power by pandering to all ideologies and yet not really representing any of them. And in that sense, you can say, based on my overview of the white movement, Putin is the perfect white politician. He is everything and he is nothing. And as is probably true in my counterfactual scenario here with a white victory, it is very uncertain whether the Tsar will ever be restored to Russia. Well, thank you for your um, point on, on that. So, uh, moving on from the whites. Okay, so with the Bolsheviks, okay, so before now we've mentioned how um, Stalin um, wanted to admire people like Ivan the Terrible, um, which we'll, we'll get to in a bit, but that's not the only one from my reading. There were other Russian Tsars he also wanted to emulate or inspired by, including in Peter the Great. And um, he consciously tried to um, promote this in propaganda. And um, so on the left, there is, um, I've got this image of the Bronze Horseman. It's a um, statue of Peter the Great that's in um, St. Petersburg. Uh, it was commissioned by Catherine the Great in 1783. Uh, so later on in the 19th century, the um, famous Russian poet um, Alexander Pushkin wrote a poem about the statue called the the bronze horseman and in the poem he's very praiseworthy of them um, of peace the great's reign and later on with this image on the right there was this propaganda campaign where um pushkin's work was promoted in the the soviet era and this poem especially promoting the um <clears throat> promoting sort of peace of the peace of the great so um, is there any particular thought you have on this at all or uh, no, I just think this is all flowing from the idea that Stalin has attempted to create socialism in one country. Once you remove the purely doctrinaire Marxist point of view, and once you tacitly disabuse yourself of the purely materialistic arc in history, once you have suddenly made the political system of Russia predicated upon the will of the strong leader, then it is only expedient to predicate your leadership upon historical precedent. I, I can't think of any single leader in any historical context who hasn't done this. You know, the Marxists may attempt to essentially project themselves as being, you know, the, <laughs> the prophets of history, yet at the same time, removing themselves from any fidelity to the past, yet as is the case with all your know, vener veneration of the past, yet at the same time, the Soviet Union is able to find a materialist and Marxist dialectic underpinning all of these figures. And the reason I find it so preposterous, of course, is that 
these ideas would be completely foreign to the historical figures of which they've been assigned. Nevertheless, the expediency always exists. And I would say it's not something unique to Russia at all. So to finally come to um, the idea of Stalin and um, Ivan, Ivan the Terrible. So what I've put up here, um, Stalin, this syncretism, because I had it in my head at least, if, if we were talking about these dual natures of, of Russia. So again, you've got the emulation of the first Tsar, um, Ivan the Terrible. So you're, you're blending these older ideas of Russian autocracy with the sort of, again, going back to the Toynbee's mention of Hen Henry Ford, uh, but with the the modern mechanize, mechanization and industry into the <clears throat> into his political program as as a red red czar, uh, do you think? I mean, do you think there's anything else we add to that, or do you think we've already um co covered that quite quite um pr profoundly? Uh, well, I think I've made a stab at it. Um, I guess in terms of trying to substantiate this, I mean, obviously. Stalin could not call himself a czar because of the ideology of which he's been saddled. He wasn't supreme in that sense, where he could have simply adopted the trappings had he wanted to, but he simply didn't need to. He already had the power. And indeed, he could represent himself as the ultimate centrist, the sensible centrist, where only he was thinking about the good of the union and by extension, the global success of the revolution. Ivan the Terrible positioned himself again ahead of those factional interests which sought to undermine Russia and ally themselves with foreign interests. This was taken amidst a war against Poland, Lithuania and against Sweden and I believe Denmark as well. And when you see cities supposedly considering switching sides like Novgorod, Ivan the Terrible destroyed it. In the same way that with Stalin, when populations have been overtaken by the expanse of the Wehrmacht into, into Russia, such as the Crimean Tatars or indeed the Volga Germans, then these populations will have to be decimated, they will have to be removed. Anything that could essentially be considered complicity with enemy aliens or capitalist infiltrators to lead a sabotage campaign against the Soviet Union and therefore to weaken the revolution from within. I think all this rhetoric was very much apparent from a different angle with the Oplichnina, the idea that essentially a whole third of the, of the czarist government or the czarist uh, realm could be reorganized in the same way that Stalin carried out his purges. Ivan the Terrible carried out his purchase of the boyars. And in so doing, he was able to establish the first real precedent of Russian autocracy, something that had only been gradually gaining momentum up until that point. And so I do see a lot of comparisons with Stalin here. But of course, Stalin represents that dualistic element. He is at the same time analogous with Ivan the Terrible, yet he is completely hostile to... Ivan the Terrible's deeply found religious sentiment, which is why looking at this from a purely materialistic lens only gets you so far, and why Stalin's appeal to Ivan the Terrible ring hollow. Ivan the Terrible really did consider himself as ruling during an apocalyptic age. The Livonian Wars and the turmoil that that brought upon Russia had an apocalyptic element to it. I don't believe Stalin was ever motivated by such supernatural observations, but of course, being a seminarian, he was fully aware of them and knew how to exploit them. I think that would be the fundamental difference. And then the way that Stalin represents a part of the Russian identity, but also this materialistic ideology, which has been superimposed upon it. <clears throat> well, in terms of... <laughs> And being living in an apocalyptic situation, I think um, the 
Great Patriotic War did present some sort of um, apocalyptic situation. Yes, to, but, um, well, I mean, what do you even call? I mean, the Great Patriotic War, even if it's, even if it's a naming convention, Stalin understood that the war for the defense of socialism was never going to motivate the average Russian peasant to fight. So understanding that and being a student of history that he was, Stalin was obsessed with the 1812 campaign. And so when he declared the Great Patriotic War, it was in direct imitation of the 1812 campaign and all of the apocalyptic overtures that that had. The difference is, is that Stalin is merely appealing to those ideas. He doesn't actually believe them himself. He is a pure sort of politician and that he understands what essentially is, you can say, Spengler's iteration of the Russian spirit. Yet he himself, in many ways, stands above it, simultaneously panders to it and is also hostile to it. Right. Well, thank you for that further elucidation. Uh, okay, I think we've got one. Yeah, this is the final one. So, okay, the, uh, the final thing I really wanted to talk about is, again, we've I've talked about this idea of um, sort of looking both both east and, and west. So, obviously, with the defeat of the um, Nazi Germany and the partition of Europe but with the NATO countries and the, the Warsaw Pact. Sort of, I mentioned this before, um, obviously with the Napoleonic invasion and then the German invasion, and then you've got the Cold War. Again, you've you sort of got a Russia, which is sort of feeling like its back is against the wall while it's being hemmed in from the West by by hostile forces. And um, that's especially true after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the NATO expansion, pushing it further and even leading up today with the, the, war, in, the war in Ukraine. And because, um, again, you mentioned Putin earlier. Putin's a sort of a fascinating le leader because, in my opinion, considering his um, current predicament. In an ideal world, um, I think he would have liked to have had a constructive relationship with the West, but that's not the situation he's in. So, which is why he's had to turn East and pursue this um, partnership with the Chinese to secure his, um, his Eastern flank while he <clears throat> tries to... Um, push back the crushing force that's coming from, from the West. What's your, your thoughts on that? Well, it's a situation which certainly benefits the Chinese, something which couldn't have been conceived of even really 60 years ago, 50 years ago, where Russia essentially acts as the frontier for Sino expansionism. In terms of trying to find a historical comparison about the situation Russia finds itself now. I would say that the situation for Russia is actually in some ways worse than in 1923 to about 1939, where most European countries had a hostile relationship. And the reason I say that is because Europe wasn't an allied buffer or really, I mean, a subjugated buffer working at the behest of the United States. So the hostility which is being directed at Russia now is far more unified from the European angle. However, of course, you mentioned China. When Russia was similarly isolated in Europe before the Nazi-Soviet pact, Russia didn't, though the Soviet Union didn't have a great ally to lean back on like China. And indeed, you can say that the Soviet Union is more responsible than any sort of outside actor for creating the People's Republic of China. Yet the irony, of course, is that Stalin was had for a time a constructive relationship with the West. The West essentially permitted the expansionism of the Soviet Union thus far. 
and in some cases they were actively sort of collaborating with the Soviet Union. I believe the West is far more ideologically driven now than it was even then. So I don't see a situation or a present sort of resolution to this current situation. I don't believe we're going to see a great patriotic war-esque situation where Putin is going to be marshaled and hosting a military parade in Paris or Stalin in Berlin. I don't really know how the situation is going to emerge because like I said, Europe is united in its hostility towards Russia and Russia comparatively is probably weaker now with the exception of the Yeltsin years is weaker now than at nearly any point since 1812. So I don't really know how this is going to turn out, but the historical examples we would look to would perhaps precipitate or foresee some sort of great Russian re-expansion into Europe. But I, I'm absolutely not certain of that. Mm. No, I'm not certain of, of that, that either. Um, but another thing I wanted to raise is um, all of this hostility Part, part of me just, just thinks that there is an element of the Western minds that just can't comprehend or, or understand Russia, hence the hostility. Would you agree or do you think that's maybe a bit oversimplified? Um, in terms of the old Churchillian aphorism that Russia is, what is it, Russia is a puzzle wrapped in enigma or something along those lines. Um, I'm going to put it more simply than that and say well, Russia refuses not to be an empire. During the Tsarist Empire, of course, Russia was undeniably a great power. Even with attempts to frustrate that with the Crimean War, Russia always represented some form of imperial threat in the British case to India, in the German case to its very territory. With the Soviet Union, of course, the Soviet Union claimed not to be an empire, but it was an empire, and an empire which was substantiated, consolidated greatly under Stalin and expanded into Europe. I think what the West wants to see in Russia is its dissolution, because even a truncated Russia after the fall of the Soviet Union is still a mighty beast. It has significant natural resources. It is the largest country in the world, but it is also a large multi-ethnic country. I think the only way that the West can reconcile Russia is through Russian submission and disintegration. And because Russia refuses to submit to that, this hostility will continue to exist. And I believe this has been the situation since perhaps at least 1815. And, um, well, obviously the title of this stream was um, The Joint Nature of Russian Civilization. Obviously with, obviously you've got this idea of the, you know, you've got the South Slavs, the East Slavs and the West Slavs, but the East Slavs being the Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians. Um, I think it's interesting when you look at a country like Ukraine, that in a, in a weird way, that country also has this um, a dual nature, one Russian and one, and one, one Ukrainian, and its inability to sort of reconcile these two has sort of partly led to the, this current war, and what's your thoughts on that? Well, don't you sort of recognise that this point is really contingent on the previous point, which is that Ukraine is a prototype. If the West can make Ukraine into a genuine bastion of anti-Russianism, that Ukraine really is the first domino for the disintegration of a Russian super-identity. The next step, of course, will be to detach the Belarusians. But if you can peel away Ukraine and Belarus and you can create a civil war within the East Slavic group, then surely the total disintegration of Russia will follow. 
you know that that would make sense considering the um because as you said it is multi-ethnic because there's um there's obviously there's the caucasian group such as the uh, the chechens for example and um there's also the further eastern siberia you've got the, the tartars and, and other such groups as well so there's um plenty that they could carve up and, and balkanize it certainly Well, that is the end of the slide and the last points I really wanted to go over. So um, thank you very much um, for taking part in this discussion, AM. Um, I mean, are there any really sort of final thoughts at all? Or? Um, no, really. I think the only point I wanted to bring up really was actually a point to begin with, which is talking about the geography of Russia and Ukraine, really, because... Um, a pseudo history has really arisen, especially substantiated since the war, uh, whereby Ukraine represents the true patrimony of a Russian civilization, I think superficially because its capital was in Kiev, and that Russia represents some sort of Mongolic aberration. In that sense, you can say that what Kiev is supposed to represent is a true form of westernized Russian civilization, albeit they would disabuse the idea of Russia and say Rus, even though the etymological roots are the same, and even though the terms Luthenia and Russia come from the same source of Rus. So you can say this is even this is even represented in the geography, even up until the First World War. A large segment of the Rusinian population was held under the Austrian Empire. So this idea of the conflict between East and West isn't simply a matter of ideology. It's not simply a matter of the confused political direction or the direction of expansionism. But I think it's reflected in the fractured geography of the post-Soviet Union itself. Ironically, the only state to really include the patrimony of all the Eastern Slavs, the dream at least of the moderate pan-Slavics was the Soviet Union. So this nationalistic aim was achieved under a state which was supposed to supersede all nationalisms. An ultimate sort of um, paradox, if you, if you will. Uh, but no, thank you for those, um, those, those final, final comments. So, uh, so now this is the end of the stream. If anybody's got any questions, um, please um, put them in the chat now, and um, me or AM will do our best to answer them. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions, so well, thank you for coming on again. Uh, I, um, uh, was there anything you'd like to shill before we finish? Uh, no, uh, just if anyone is watching this and hasn't already seen um, my various videos on, on Russian history, I, I do go over some of these concepts in a bit more depth if you want to look at that. There's one particular thing I want to mention actually which is a, a stream which is i think under under sort of exposed on my channel which is a stream about the reflections of a russian statesman which i go over with mr patriarch um if you want a sort of elucidation of the reactionary position in russian politics i think that's a great place to start mm -hmm. Yeah, so I did actually watch that stream, and that was um, highly fascinating because um, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation, but um, Papa Robert Dostoev was certainly a, an interesting um, thinker, and his insights are shared by Mr. Patriot were, were worth listening to. And um, so I've got a comment here, Darth Kilhoon, I wish American and Europeans would get off their high horse and accept their Russian brothers as fellow Westerns. Yes, I wish we could have a more productive relationship, but that's sadly not the situation that, that we're, we're in, are we? Well, I mean, it doesn't even matter 
what you call them as fellow Westerns. I, I don't recognize what's going on at the moment. I would rather be associated with anything which disabused, is disabused from or disassociated from what's going on in the West at the moment, on the straight road into hell we're on at the moment. So I don't really care what you call it, Western or Eastern, so long as you're opposed to that, I suppose. Mm. Tragic, but <clears throat> right. Anyway, in terms of shilling, and um, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be doing a stream with a uh, furious pertinax. We're going to be looking over um, uh, my my remnants of East Africa by um, Paul Van Letter Vorbeck. So that's also going to topple us basically a stream on the. East Africa front of World War One, so that should be fascinating to go over. But so thank you everybody for watching and